I'm a lucid dreamer, and I can control my dreams and my nightmares. But last night, I had a dream that was very different from anything else. I was working on the floor of my factory job and running the forklift, like normal, until out the bay door there were fireworks. It's more like a plume of light and an explosion coming from the other side of the valley. I live in the desert. We don't have valleys where I'm at. We decided to go outside after seeing these lights fly away into the sky to the left of us. Once we get outside of the bay door, the ground is illuminated like a full moon times ten. We were now in the backyard of my childhood house. We look up to the sky trying to find the light source, but it was just a night sky. When we looked to the right, there was a typical looking alien and when it noticed us, it screeched and jumped up toward us, but it dissolved into the brightening light. I woke up in a scream and I couldn't sleep until daylight. My cat, who's pretty aware as well, stared at the wall behind me for a good 30 minutes. Now I can dream about scary stuff and when it happens, I can usually alter it. I can always control what I'm dreaming about but this was different, and I haven't dreamed about aliens in over 10 years. What is this supposed to mean? Have they decided to come back? Why me? My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift, to see and experience things that were... I guess paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, and me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened, someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after, and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members, but nothing, just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me.
This was in the summer of 2018, and it's still one of the most terrifying things I have ever experienced. At the time of this story, I was 12 years old. My sister, Jessica, called me and asked if I was up to babysit for two kids for some money for the weekend. This would be while she and her son and daughter and her best friend went to New Mexico. I agreed because I wanted some money and the kids were nice and I didn't see anything wrong with it. I lived five minutes away from my sister, so I asked her if I could go ahead and get some stuff before I came over there and she said that was fine. I got some things to stay the night and I started to get a nervous feeling in my stomach but I chalked it up to just being nervous to babysit. My mom didn't want me staying alone in the house, so my older brother Axel stayed the night with me. It was about 7 p.m. and I fed the kids dinner and bathed them, and they were ready to go to bed. I was still feeling pretty nervous, but I just shook it off. I decided I was going to sleep in my sister's room because I liked her bed and she had a giant TV. The way her house is set up, there's her room, and in her room, the back door is there. Outside of her room, directly, is the kitchen. At around 11 p.m., I heard the gate softly open, and my heart sank. I called my brother, freaking out. He ran into the room and opened the back door to see the gates were open. He called to me, oh, We probably just forgot to close them, or the wind blew them open. It'll be okay, Willow. He closed the gates and then the door, making sure to lock it. I'm gonna head to bed. If you need me, come to the living room. I smiled and continued watching TV. I kept hearing tapping and knocking sounds all night, and I was really freaked out. I kept texting my mom, and she told me to just try to relax and watch some Netflix. I did that for a couple of hours, and at about 3 a.m., I realized I was really hungry. I decided to go into the kitchen and get some food. As I entered, I felt my stomach drop as I heard the back door open. It felt as though ice water was injected into my veins. To this day, I have never felt the terror that I felt right then. I heard footsteps behind me, and I felt heavy breathing on my neck. I glanced down the counter and I saw a knife. I quickly grabbed it and turned around. I saw nobody there, but the back door was wide open. Tears welled up in my eyes as I ran into the living room. I woke up my brother sobbing and he called my mom while holding me. The rest of the night we heard loud stomping and loud taps. And to this day, I am still terrified of her house. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet. Another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. 
This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen, and then we heard the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking, and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car, without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. This story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job free popcorn, soda, and candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town and randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working. Not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he had heard a rumor of some weird lights out in an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started to back up what Tiege was saying, so I told him that as soon as I had finished up cleaning the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at around 1am. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck, so the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to this cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck, so I parked the truck right in front of it. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at two o'clock in the morning so I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes pass, and we're starting to see these fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could even see them in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw, but before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill, and that's when I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us, and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been from them moving around in the woods where trees were blocking the light. I started freaking out, and I was screaming at both of them, and I told them that if they were playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, it wasn't funny and that I was leaving. I tried to start the truck, but it turned once and then died. Tiege had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. 
At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas while turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew I needed to get us out of there. Tej was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted this thing to get closer, but I wasn't hearing it. I was shaking and I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we came. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tej and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer searching to see if I could find any explanation for what I had seen. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? No idea. It all seemed like BS to me, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her out there, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge, walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on tombstones, flashlights, footprints, anything, but we didn't see a thing that could explain what I saw the night before. The cemetery was way too far away from any major road for it to have been car lights. I still don't know what we saw that night, and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens. I've seen my own doppelganger three times in my life. The first time, I was 21, with my dad and mom, and we were going to Buena Park, California to visit Knott's Berry Farm. We lived near Seattle at the time. We were all preparing to go down to the small pool at the end of the motel. I was watching some TV and I was in no hurry. Finally, my mom came rushing back in saying, You've got to come see this. There's a guy down by the pool who looks exactly like you. Then my dad walks in saying, I said to that guy, how'd you get here so fast? Because I thought it was you. You two could be exact twins. They begged me to come down and look at the guy, but I didn't care to see myself in swimming trunks, so I declined. The second time, I was 28 and I was in Newport Beach, California. I was at a church dance where they have a large cultural hall that has no mirrors and the walls are not reflective. I'm dressed badly. I'm dressed in a brown and white lumberjack shirt with the sleeves rolled halfway up, blue jeans, and a white belt that I once borrowed from my aunt. So I go in and I find a couple there and I chat with them and try to joke with them for a minute. Then I see the snack bar, so of course I head over to it. I'm munching on some cookies and drinking some punch, and I look over to where the couple is still standing. There's a guy there trying to joke with them. He looks exactly like me. He's wearing a brown and white lumberjack shirt with the sleeves rolled halfway up, blue jeans, and a thin white girly belt. It was me just two or three minutes before. It was like I was watching the past of my own life. I dropped my half-eaten cookie and my half-drink cup of punch, and I ran out of that hall, across the foyer and out of the church. I ran for a whole block and a half. I finally stopped, out of breath, and I said to myself, wait a minute, I want to see this. So I returned to the church, looked around, and my twin was gone. I'm at the Bay Dance Club in Salt Lake City. I'm 36 by this time, and I used to sit in this one chair near the entrance to the dance floor. It gave me a good view of everything, and it was just sort of my chair. 
I mean, not really, but I kind of became a fixture there, and everybody just knew that that's where I always sat. One night, I decided to sit someplace else, on the other side of the dance floor. I tried it out, but I'm a creature of habit, and so, eventually, I decided that I couldn't really see a lot from over here, and I just didn't like it. So I got up, and I started to make my way back across the dance floor to the chair I always sat in. I see a guy sitting in that chair, and as I get closer, I realize that the guy was me. But he looked straight through me. He was sitting there doing what I always did, checking out girls and looking around. I kind of felt a panic attack coming on, so I just kept walking until I was outside, back to my car, and I drove off. Up until now, I've never seen my doppelganger again, but who knows when it might be next. I've had a couple of creepy doppelganger incidents. My earliest encounter occurred around three or four years ago. I had decided to stay with my aunt. Her house was big, with three baths and various rooms. I was on the second floor alone when everything happened. I was working on a video when my step-aunt appeared. I followed her into her room, excited to show her what I'd done with my phone. My younger cousin was also in her arms. Both of them were female. She wasn't in the room when I walked in. I turned to look behind the door, thinking she was playing a joke on me, but nobody was present. I dashed downstairs to find her, but she claimed she had never gone upstairs. It was a pretty scary experience, so I stayed downstairs. The following incident happened about two to three years ago. I'm upstairs in a house by myself once more. My family home wasn't substantial. My elder sister arrived bearing our little sister. I was probably too lazy to fetch something, so I called her from across the room. Before exiting the room, she walked up to the mirror and remained there, still without responding to me. I followed her out of the room as she went at a slow pace. She was nowhere to be found. I dashed downstairs once again, where my elder sister was apparently showering in another bathroom. My younger sister was downstairs too, playing with her toys. Once again, I was super creeped out and I stayed downstairs. There are numerous parallels between these two situations. I was alone upstairs in a house that belonged to a relative. The people that came upstairs were all women and one of them was holding a toddler. Both rooms had a bed with a mirror pointing straight in the direction of the bed, and it happened in the afternoon. I don't really know what all of this means, or if these parallels mean anything at all, but I'm a little bit freaked out. This is not necessarily super creepy, but creepy enough in a sense that it gave me some peace, and I think maybe my grandma some peace too. It was around Christmas time. I was staying with my then boyfriend, and I was staying over at his house, sleeping down in the basement. That night, I had a really strange dream. I was in a house, and there was a party going on. When I was there, an older man approached me. He knew my name, and I felt like I knew him. But I also knew that I had never met him in person, and I couldn't place him. He was really sweet, very nice, and we just kind of stared at each other. It was like we were having a conversation, but we weren't. It was kind of strange. I felt so comfortable with him as a person does with a close family member. Finally, he said, Hey, tell your Nana I say hi, and I love her. And I was like, Oh, okay, sure. And then I woke up. I told my grandma about it the next day, 
and gave her some information on what the guy looked like. She started crying on the phone, saying, You just saw my dad. I guess he had died a few years before I was born, and I'm actually named after him partially. My middle name is Joe. Turns out his birthday was on December 31st. I believe he would have been 90-something, and the dream that I had was also on December 31st. I just had a strange dream the other night, and I can't quite make heads or tails of it. Quick background that pertains to the dream. My dad passed when I was 13 years old, and when I was really struggling with the loss back then, he appeared to me in a dream, keeping this looming darkness at bay and telling me that I would be alright. I later told somebody about that dream, and they told me that sometimes, when a loved one dies, they can come to you in dreams. I didn't believe or disbelieve really, but it felt like a bit of comfort at the time. Now throughout the years I have had a dream here or there about my dad, and I always found a little comfort in thinking, hmm, maybe it's him. Fast forward about 16 years to my dream last night. So in the dream, I was in this boggy, swampy looking area. It was dark, but still lit enough that I could see a road. I was on the road and I knew my destination was the grave of an ancestor maybe like a great-grandfather, and all of a sudden my dad shows up in a suburban. I hop in and we're talking when he almost drives it into a soft shoulder or ditch, which my dad wouldn't do while driving because he drove professionally in his life. We continued down the road and we got to this graveyard where I start asking him questions that he can't answer or is answering wrong, stuff that he would know. I just got this bad feeling. I just looked at him and said, You're not my dad. He didn't get upset, but he insisted that he was and almost seemed amused. I kept looking for a grave and insisting that he wasn't my father. All the while he kept laughing and saying, Of course I am. This horse appears and starts bucking and rearing and really causing a stir until finally my dad went away. The next thing I know, I'm talking to a woman in a place that was just nothing. Like, a place that was just void of everything but her and me. She said something like, When you let your dad in as a kid, you broke open a grate. And in my dream, I had envisioned like a giant sewer grate. She said it allowed all manner of spirits to come and visit as they pleased, and to masquerade as my dad. She didn't seem at all concerned or like it was a bad thing, just like she was telling me something that was a fact. At that point, I woke up. The details are obviously a little fuzzy, but I can't stop thinking about it this morning. I just figured I'd see what anyone else had to say. Maybe it was just a weird dream, but... It certainly felt like something else. This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. 
I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway. I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience if my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall shadowy figure at the end of the hall in front of my bedroom. At first, she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her. But the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light, and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later, and my dad backs up the claim, since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on, because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. I feel like I should start this story with a content warning first side. About three days ago, I had a pretty weird dream. I dreamt that the mother of my mom's friend committed side. I don't remember how, I just remember getting the news from her grandson in the dream. Never met the woman in my life. I only heard about her a few times about a month or two ago. Skip to today. My mom receives a call from the friend, and my stomach just drops. It's like I know that something's wrong. And it is. The woman had hung herself about a half an hour prior. What the heck just happened? Was it all a creepy coincidence? I don't have any emotional connection with that woman at all, nor had I been thinking about her before the dream occurred. My grandmother also had some dream predictions before, but no major events, just some random things. It's really unsettling to me, and I have no idea how to explain it. For the first time in my life, I had a really lucid dream. At least I hope that's what it was. I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, my time, PST. At my back door, it's a security door, so like a metal screen door, I saw something and I thought it was my wife. I asked her why she was out there 
and she said that she had accidentally locked herself out. I had been out there not five minutes before, and I knew that I didn't lock the door. She was wearing her normal bedtime apparel, but her hair wasn't the right color, and her voice wasn't quite right. I asked again what she was doing, and she just says, just let me in. I get closer to the door, but I can't see her face. I say again, why are you out there? She ignores me again and says, just let me in. I move to open the door, and I noticed that she changed to an inhumanly small frame, which was all black and had no features. I slammed the wood door and bolted to find my wife asleep in the bed where I had left her. Now, if I'm honest, I don't even believe I was dreaming, but my mind cannot comprehend that as being real. Nothing anywhere near that level of paranormal has ever happened to me before. And whether or not it was a dream, it was definitely freaky. And I'm still trying to figure it out. For almost 10 years, a few other people in my family and I have had very extreme paranormal experiences. Most of it is too long to get into now. A lot of it is tied to a house that's demonically possessed, and possibly a deceased family member who was quite emotionally disturbed and dabbled way too much in the wrong parts of the occult. But last night, I had a very intense dream. In it, this feminine demonic creature thing was over my grandfather in his sleep. I went to go fight it, and it screamed at me like a banshee. I backed away for a second, right before I woke up. Like I said, this thing felt very feminine, but to describe how it looked is a little bit difficult. It looked almost as though a large, roughly human-sized sheet of leather became sentient and started floating and moving and flying. It didn't have a solid, discernible form exactly either. It literally almost looked like a flying leather monster. It was so black, roughly around where its head might have been, that it was more black than black itself, if that makes any sense. But besides that, like I said, it just sort of looked like a flying leather monster. And then, of course, there was the horrible, threatening scream. I've had other encounters in my sleep with evil paranormal entities at this point, and it's pretty much all connected to that certain house, and possibly that family member. But I'm just wondering what it was. Was it actually a banshee? There's also this wolf that has been stalking around the house for a few months now. It attacked our dog, actually. The house is in Connecticut, but it's in the north, where it's very condensed forest. So it's extremely uncommon, but not unfathomable, that a rogue wolf ended up there. I personally saw a mountain lion there once, and I've seen my fair share of black bears. But I don't know what this thing could have been. I haven't actually lived in the house in question for about four years, other family still does, though. I don't know what's going on, and I've never seen an entity like that thing before. I'm just trying to figure out if anybody might know what it is. About three years ago, my friend who I had known since birth was diagnosed with leukemia. After an intense and scary year-long battle, the cancer won. I miss him so much that I'm tearing up just writing this. Something happened before he died, though, that was really weird. I was eating some food in my dream, and my friend rang the doorbell. 
He had all of his hair, and he looked happy and healthy. He looked at me and said, I had a life I was going to live, and I couldn't live it. I want you to live a life and enjoy it. He smiled a bit and shrugged and said, Hey, it'll be okay without me. I'll miss you too up there. But don't worry about me. The pain is gone. He went in for a hug, and we hugged for what felt like an eternity. I love you, man, he said, as his parents' car door opened. I yelled, Mark, don't leave me. Live. You have to live. He just looked at me and said, Sorry, man. I gotta go, and kind of laughed. I screamed and screamed, don't leave me, over and over. But he got in the car, drove down the street, into a bright blue light, his favorite color. The second that the car was engulfed, I woke up crying and screaming. This all happened just as my mom got home. She walked in as I was crying and she said, Mark died. And I just kept crying and said, I know, I know. I cried for the whole day, but it did feel better being able to say goodbye in some way. I really do miss him. Rest in peace, Mark. Yesterday evening, my fiancé and I joined two friends from high school, who I'll refer to as C and W, for an evening of board games and drinks. Given it was their first time meeting my fiancé, C and W decided to ensure that he had his fair share of drinks. Our location was W's house, where C offered to sleep on the couch, and my fiancé and I claimed the guest bedroom. After several rounds of drinks, my fiancé started feeling ill, prompting us to retire to the guest room. For some reason, I was plagued by a sense of restlessness and only managed to drift off at about seven in the morning. That's when I had this dream. In my dream, I was half awake, listening to C and W's conversation in the hallway outside our room. C was bidding goodbye, and as I drifted back to sleep, I heard his car pulling away. W, checking in on us through the door, asked if we were up yet. In my semi-conscious state, I said, no, not yet, and dozed off once more. An hour or so later, an elderly woman entered the room to wake us up. Concurrently, I heard noises of W, who seemed to be ill and possibly crying in the bathroom across the hallway. The woman, with a thick southern accent, more reminiscent of Mississippi or Alabama than our native Louisiana, suggested we start packing up due to W's condition. I can still hear her voice to this day. She had short white hair and penciled on eyebrows, characteristic of older southern ladies. Although I can't recall her exact words, she was extremely gentle and helpful as we gathered our belongings to leave. I woke up at 10 o'clock in the morning, momentarily disoriented, as the vivid dream had me fully expecting to be in my own bed, not the guest room of W's house. I shared my unsettling dream with my fiancé, and then decided to begin tidying up the remnants of the previous night's festivities. W, C, and my fiancé eventually joined me in the living room, where we talked about the night before, and I told them about this dream. Upon describing the woman in my dream, W's face turned ashen. He asked for some additional details, before saying, My step-grandmother died in this house. I initially thought he was joking, until he showed me a picture on his phone. And there she was, the lady from my dream, standing next to W's grandfather. W confirmed that she was indeed from Mississippi and had a pronounced accent. He asked me to mimic her pronunciation of his name from my dream, which made him chuckle because he said it was a perfect imitation. Disturbed by this, I quickly finished cleaning and then drove home with my fiancé. So, dear lady, I apologize for our part in your grandson's illness from excessive drinking, and thank you for your hospitality.
However, I would definitely prefer it if you wouldn't give me such a fright in the future. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21 year old female in my second year of nursing and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park and at night when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rear view mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter because it was light enough to see the sky and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. 
Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window i curled to the ground gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place and that's how i fell asleep that night i left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else if anyone has any clue what's going on or what this thing is and can tell me what i can do let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences, but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way, though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia, in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge, with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack, and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me at this point like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was and the rain started pouring down. I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini-fridge door slowly opening. 
I got up to check it out. I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot. So I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit of a formerly enslaved person who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on, because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear. But there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day, so there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience, and it felt cleansing. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man. So I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things, doors opening that shouldn't be, unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, 
I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different. Almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night. Stupid, I know. And I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though, not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. My family owns a large piece of land in Missouri. It's near the highlands, but partially on the plains. It includes a lovely little chapel, a one-room schoolhouse, stables, and the plantation home. My family has owned the land for years. I grew up spending school breaks there. It was always enjoyable, regardless of the hard work I had to put in. Every Halloween, my family would do a local hayride and barbecue. It was great fun and everyone loved it. We decorated the entire property. The schoolhouse had all the original desks and materials left in it. So we tried to utilize it the most and the plantation home secondly. It wasn't super structurally sound, so we kept everybody on the first floor. Only family was allowed on the upper floors. Us cousins loved to set up and clean for the big night. The stables were a working area, so we left that to the adults. Nobody went inside the chapel because we wanted to make sure that it stayed in its original good condition. So we'd put up a fake little graveyard and that was about it. The school was abandoned and the house was a walkthrough. When I was 16, I was helping set up the walkthrough. It was cheesy, but fun. I was cleaning the ornate mirrors on the first floor when I heard laughter above me. Figuring it was my cousins, I kept working. I would hear the footsteps of them moving and their laughter for a while. 
When I got done, I called up that I was going to go help outside, and I heard, All right, see you later, and more laughter. I walked out smiling because I found it cute that they were so immersed in the home. Imagine my confusion then, when I walked into all four cousins at the main house. I asked them how they had beaten me back, and they looked at me like I'd finally lost it. They told me that they'd been working on the chapel graveyard, and they'd been nowhere near the walkthrough. I told them it wasn't nice to try to trick me. We left it at that and continued on for the day. I only realized we weren't alone when I got a call from my youngest cousin, asking why I was running around upstairs in the plantation home. I got deathly quiet. When she asked me again, I could only say, I'm not even on the property. I'm in town. To this day, we've never figured out who exactly lives upstairs. They don't cause harm, but they do enjoy their mischief. Anymore, we keep in constant contact when we're visiting, just to be sure we know who we're dealing with. Or what. When I was about 10 years old, I went with my dad to his farm. I spent my vacations there as a child. I don't have a very good memory of my childhood. I hated school. Everything was so bad that I think I erased almost everything from my mind. But that day is like a video of 24 hours that I have never been able to erase. I got there at night, and as soon as we got there, my mom called. I knew it was because I got some bad grades and almost failed at school. My dad was talking to her, and then he told me to go close the main door. As soon as I got there, I saw a humanoid figure, totally translucent. Only its borders were visible. And behind it, six floating light balls, alternating between blue and red. It was very tall but its proportions were not distorted. It was exactly humanoid, but I could see everything straight through it. The dogs at the farm were surrounding it and barking at it, making angry noises. I was a very scared child, but that thing didn't scare me right away. I got curious instead, so I asked, who are you? And it took a step forward. I immediately started crying and ran back inside, calling my dad, saying there was someone in there. He turned off the phone and without hesitation, went to a wardrobe and took a shotgun hidden between some clothes. When we got outside, it had vanished, but the dogs were still barking and surrounding a certain place in the front of the house, farther away this time, but there was nothing there. It's a plain space with our house in the middle of it. There's nothing surrounding us. After 30 seconds or so, the dog stopped and came back inside like nothing had happened. My dad said that I had just seen an optical illusion of the lights from the bus that brought students that arrived around that time. I don't think so. I still have no clue what that was, and I've never had anything similar happen after that. But I remember that day perfectly and it's going to be about 10 years from the day now, next month. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not, is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the Cemetery, 
because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods, and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically, a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield 1, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost, but he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot, but the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then, a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. 
I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door, and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house, and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of societal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone and simply using a nightlight to sleep. 
The last time I lived in that house full time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just a darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house. So I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me? wondering if anybody has any information about the Omni Bedford Springs in Pennsylvania. I live very close and I used to go there daily to swim. It flooded when I was a child. In the early 2000s, Omni bought it and restored it while adding on as well. Construction workers reported many strange occurrences. It was James Buchanan's summer White House it was a facility to hold foreign diplomats during the wars. The springs are known to have healing properties. I have always felt a presence in the old section of the main hotel. I swam laps there for years in the famous pool. One day, they were filling the pool and the hose was still. They fill it using the natural spring water from the mountain. About 15 minutes later, it looked as if a child was holding it and playing with it swinging it around. My friend and I always swam together and we both saw it. And then we both saw it suddenly stop. On other occasions, we would hear splashing when nobody was in the pool. One time I felt a huge movement in the water while swimming. Nobody was there though. We were the only ones there and my friend wasn't in the pool. We also spotted a gentleman at the top of the stairs to the balcony, where the band used to play for the pool, but nobody was there when we looked again. I have also sat in the library many times reading while waiting on my friend to arrive, or before I hit the road. I would hear sounds. I'm not sure what the room used to be, but the windows are scratched from brides testing their diamonds, I was told. They also have some of the guest ledgers there. All of the things that happened to me were between 3 in the morning and 6 in the morning. Does anybody have any idea what's going on there?
For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. I've also seen figures. It was early morning, I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room. A black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing, and would sometimes see black figures, or a man with a mustache, in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. 
so I reached forward to pet him, and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. The shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on, and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner, and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed, and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars, and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now, I'm just wondering what comes next. skeptic, but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird History Channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible. It's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods. Miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars, which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set, and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small, bluish orbs, and honestly, the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought, there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me, other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this, though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit, because I would have no way of proving that. 
electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that. But that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working. But both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it, as it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap, we all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color, and a worn-out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than forty. He looked at us for a while, and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person... We're never going back up there again. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted, and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. 
A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work, because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about one, while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking. So, I should start this by saying, I'm a healthy, sane, 18-year-old male. I've never had hallucinations or been seriously sick in my life. I've also never been known to black out or take micro naps. My mother has schizophrenia, but as far as I know, it was pretty mild, and I've never had any symptoms of it. With all of that out of the way, here's what happened. I was hanging out with my significant other before they went to class at college and before I had to go to work. We parted ways and I got on the bus to go home and get ready. I got on the bus with five other people and I sat in the back, as I usually do, so all five were in front of me. I looked down to check my phone when the bus started to move so I could check the route, because I'm a nervous person and I wanted to make sure that I was on the right route. I was. I looked up after maybe 30 seconds, and I'm absolutely positive that the bus had not stopped to let anyone off. Somehow though, all five of the people that I had gotten on with were just gone. The only people on the bus were me and the driver. It freaked me out a good bit because the next bus stop was still up ahead, so there's no way the bus had stopped and let people out in the middle of the road. I checked my phone again to get my mind off of it, and then suddenly the bus turned onto a different street, which is weird since the route had no turns. It was a straight line. I'm very much into horror, so my immediate thought was, great, I guess I'm going to hell. I signaled that I wanted to get off though, and the driver let me off without saying anything. I've been thinking about this all day, and I still have no idea what could have happened there. I know it's not as creepy as some stories, but it genuinely freaked me out. I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy, but this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy, and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down, although I kept thinking. What is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, familiar and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. 
I look up and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. But it was interesting, and I wanted to share. For some background, whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school. And it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes when I finally said, are you okay? I asked, without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, there's a man there. There was no man there, no person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady but that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but I'll never forget it. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents. Accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus, a young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong and she said that there was nobody back there 
and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no buddy. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, Bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex with most of its buildings run down and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night Always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight, and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, what the? And I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure-sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. When I was a kid, I was sitting in the back seat of my parents' car, traveling through a built-up area, when my brother, who was sitting next to me, suddenly cried out in fear. My mom was in the front passenger seat and quickly turned around to ask what the matter was. My brother said, I've just seen a woman standing in a bus shelter and she didn't have a face. He then went on to explain that where her face should have been, there was just a gaping hole, but it was glowing white. The bus shelter had been on my side of the road, but I had been looking out the front, so I never saw anything. I asked my mom if we could go back and see if the woman was still there, but my brother was genuinely scared and begged us not to. At the time, my mom said that she thought it was just her car's headlights flashing in the woman's face. But the way my brother was so scared definitely made me question that explanation. I'm 
a middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. My cat and I were on the bus, heading up to a takeaway so I could get food for us. The nice lady sells tuna to me for my cat. And I saw multiple figures get onto the bus out of the corner of my eye. My cat even meowed at them. But when I stood up, there was no one around other than the driver. I asked the driver if anybody else had gotten on. 
And he just kind of shook his head and gave me this worried look. I think he had seen what I had seen, but didn't want to address it. On my walk home that night from the chippy, I saw numerous shadows in the fog, which startled my cat so much that he actually jumped off my shoulder, and I later found him at home. Usually, my cat is really well behaved, so I have no idea, but that night and that night bus were freaky. A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked, but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town, and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed, and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area, before construction began, was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m. I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly, I got a very cold chill 
up and down my spine, and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again, and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle, and then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me, and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath, and for some reason, the energy that I felt was not a positive one. So I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop. As I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point, and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I heard a knock on my car's mirror. I work as a security guard in various hospitals, and I keep on changing sites during my shift because that's what my job requires me to do. I was going to another site tonight at about 12.30 in the morning, when I stopped my car at a signal. The roads were pretty empty, emptier than usual, maybe due to the long weekend here in Canada. It was all dark around and not even a single person or car. Then when I stopped at the signal, my car just turned off automatically. Then I heard some kind of knock, as though somebody was knocking on the back mirror of my car. I looked around from the inside, but I couldn't see anybody. I checked all the mirrors and the doors and they were all locked and then I left. There was nobody and nothing around that could have made that noise. And I'm just wondering if anybody can explain this. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant. So I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. 
The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were. And I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot. And it was just deserted. Nobody lived there. Not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street. And people noticed that every house nearby was shut closed. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing, and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like, maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. I'm a female, and I was hanging out in the car last night at about 5 in the morning with my best friend, who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city, so we were trying to find a flat, high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east, until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation, because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly there weren't any buildings or lights around at all, just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was, and I said, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that, but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped, and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end, and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet, and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot, like that feeling just before you pass out. Almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough. 
It's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker. Like, unnaturally dark. I got this feeling that just kept telling me I have to get us out of here right now. Turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her, but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead, speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first, but apparently in the moment we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. Heidi said something like, Maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but no logical human explanation feels sinister enough. I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end sign, the woods get thicker and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this non-profit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something, and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. 
It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch-style house with a three-car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside, where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway, when suddenly, the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors, and my heart began to race. Then, they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway. And there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there. And it visited me, only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. apologize if this doesn't make sense, but I am freaked out and I have no idea how to explain this. My co-worker and I were driving back from dinner to the place we were staying at. We had driven this route a handful of times and were very familiar with the surrounding area. It was a seven minute drive from the restaurant to where we were staying. We left the restaurant and had a straight drive for about two miles no turns until we had to take a right turn into the parking area of the property that we were staying at. As we approached the hotel, the tall Courtyard by Marriott sign was visible, as was the building. We were a block away from the turn, and then we just suddenly weren't. We were all of a sudden driving on a highway, about to take the exit to the right. It was immediately apparent and I said to my coworker, wait, something's wrong here. And he replied, yeah, what the heck just happened? We were just about to turn into the parking area. I told him to pull over and I looked up on maps where we were. The map showed that we were 20 minutes away in the opposite direction that we'd come from. It was physically impossible. The time on the clock was still the same as it had been when we were next to the hotel. I don't understand, and neither does he, and he doesn't want to tell anybody because it sounds so crazy. But somehow, we were teleported 20 minutes away. It was the single most disorienting feeling I have ever experienced. But now, ever since, I feel like everybody in my life has just changed. Everyone feels so distant. I can't shake the feeling 
that something is still very off. My family owns a factory in the north of England. The building is 1890s as far as I can tell, and was built as a large shed for boilers that provided steam to power the steam engines in the big mill next door. The mill has since been demolished. It has a large water tank underneath it and a system to collect rainwater. The roof is made with cast iron trestles that incorporate internal gutters. It's fascinating. My brother is convinced that the place is haunted. Stuff apparently moves around on its own, and voices have been heard in the factory from the office when the factory was empty. We had an old bloke working for us a few years back who swears he saw the ghost of a man on several occasions. He did used to secretly drink several cans of John Smith's bitter whilst on shift though, so who knows? But he's not the only one. So far, I haven't experienced anything, but if I do, I'll be sure to let you know. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55 and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 556. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 556. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had streetlights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no streetlights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far-off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road. 
the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced, and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out, I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, 
there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing. And then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane in a heavily forested area that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open, and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down. And that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me, and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. When I was 15 or so, a group of my friends and I all slept over at the leader of our friend group's house. 
This guy lived in the most absolutely rural area of our rural town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out and start a bonfire deep in the woods. So we packed up, got all of our materials and went straight out there. On the way to the spot that we'd be making our campfire at, he told us about how messed up and creepy his woods are and the numerous things he's seen. White skinny figures peeking around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at it, screaming and whispers from the woods, figures watching him, all that good stuff. It set the mood pretty well. By around seven o'clock that night, we had the campfire set up and it was pitch black outside as it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire. I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was that night. You couldn't see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from the fire. Everything else was just a black wall of nothingness and the sound of the forest was so quiet that the silence was almost deafening. At least it was if we weren't talking. We ended up needing more firewood and a few other things that we were using for the campfire, so the leader took me to go with him to get it. Without a flashlight or any light source, he and I walked the mile and a half long trail back to his house in complete and utter darkness. It was all good. We were talking, joking with each other, having a good time and just hanging out when the first noises started he immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right were a bunch of different sounds, screaming, laughing, talking and whispering, shouting, people saying unintelligible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people just surrounding us. The natural night vision had finally set in a decent amount and I looked over at my friend who had his head down and didn't say a single word. Known for being a complete goofball and a wild, funny dude, I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look to him that still kind of haunts me to this day, as I knew him pretty well and he always portrayed himself as the fearless leader type. Seeing him so shaken up and afraid was very unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the heck is that? Before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and not to pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three minutes or so were incredibly uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed in total silence. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of that night. No birds, no sticks falling, not a single sound, absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. It's still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I have no explanation for and I'll never forget it. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night. I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word. So I just closed my eyes and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. 
About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, you are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so, and while collecting, I got this odd feeling and then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out. It was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling, and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens, until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves, and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep, and so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice, and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area, his uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. I should lead by saying that I tend to lean towards skepticism when it comes to the paranormal. I 100% believe that paranormal entities exist. However, more often than not, I think people psych themselves out rather than have a genuine paranormal experience. In fact, that's why it's taken me so long to follow up on my situation. I'm reconsidering the weight of the situation now based on the behaviors of people that have been around this artifact that I have, as well as some of the things that have happened to me while I was looking into it. About two years ago, I found myself volunteering at an orphanage in Uganda for six months. I decided to go out there as a way to recover from my alcoholism and move forward with my life. While I was in Uganda, I also ended up being involved with getting a primary school started and I assisted in getting a nonprofit off the ground. I was actually offered the position of operations manager at the nonprofit when I left the country, and the school was named after my friend and I in our honor. The point is, I was working really hard to have a good future, and I had succeeded in my recovery. In my last month in Uganda, a fellow volunteer gave me a gift. It was a Coptic cross that he had picked up in Ethiopia while he was on his way back into Uganda. I thought it was super cool and unique, so I got some string and fashioned it into a necklace to bring back to the States. I think it's important to note that the guy who gave it to me came from Trinidad and Tobago and outspokenly hated Americans. We clashed occasionally but we both understood that we came from different places and ideas and just agreed to disagree. To be clear though, 90% of the time we were friends and on good terms. The very first peculiar experience happened to me about six months after I had gotten back home. 
I was in line to check out in a grocery store when I saw a man who looked like he was from Africa. It's hard to explain, but when you've been in a place long enough, you can pick up on their demeanor and their clothing and things like that. The man was just walking by when he looked at me, then at my necklace, and then back at me, but this time with a look of absolute terror. At the time, I didn't think much of it, but still, it stuck with me. Before my second experience, I had some friends comment on my necklace. I was told that it had some sort of weight to it, and that something about it felt weird. I ended up asking some co-workers about it since I knew some of them were heavy believers in the spirit realm. After I took it out and showed them, nobody was comfortable standing any closer than five feet from me. They prayed for me and sent me home with a prayer book, which they claimed would keep me protected. At this point, I began to get paranoid and I began recounting weird occurrences in my apartment. One example is that my two-week-long writer's block with my music production suddenly ceased when I moved the necklace out of my studio and into another room. I kept thinking of similar circumstances. The only problem here was that I couldn't quite convince myself that I wasn't just falling victim to my own placebo. I also remember the very distinct feeling of being watched and I never really felt alone after that. One night, after overcoming my usual nightly restlessness, I fell into the comforts of sleep. The next thing I know, I had started a business in my hometown, a car wash, actually. I was showing a friend the place, and I let us all into the office. Everything in my office was neatly placed in its spot, just as it should have been. Suddenly, a man appeared walking past the doorway that exited from the side of the office into a car wash bay. Everything about the man's appearance was average. What was unsettling, though, was that I could tell that he knew I was watching him, even though he wasn't looking at me. It was just a gut feeling. The man disappeared as soon as I got a good look at him. I walked out the door in an attempt to see where he went. The man was nowhere to be seen. I walked back inside the side door of the office, and everything was trashed. I looked over at my friend and said that we needed to get the hell out of there. I led the way out of the front door, and laying on the ground in front of my feet was a horse. The horse was barely alive and was quite clearly in excruciating pain. I noticed it was missing two legs, one in the front and one in the rear. It was at that moment I realized I was in a dream, and I felt my subconscious start to panic. When I finally woke up, I was sweating and terrified. Needless to say, that sleep was not something I was going to attempt again that night. I was seriously freaked out, and decided to look into the possibility of a haunting. A week later, I found myself in the home of a spiritualist. I had made sure to leave the necklace outside to see if she could sense it as a sort of vetting process. I also made a point to be aware not to make any hints toward my experience, and more importantly, that necklace. She had told me that she felt the presence of a demon about me, and that it was not from the necklace that I had left outside. Since I made sure not to mention anything that could lead her to know about that necklace, I trusted her reading. However, I politely left after she gave me an estimate for $200 to solve my problem. I know she needs to pay her bills too, I just didn't quite have that much money at the time. A week and a half later, I went to the office of my friend's pastor's friend. She was a Christian counselor who just so happened to have some expertise in the subject. I'm not a Christian, but I figured that it wasn't really a big deal since not everybody in counseling is a Christian. So. The appointment moved forward, and I told her everything that had happened. She responded by doing some forearm muscle tests, which revealed that there were seven demons in me. She was able to relinquish six of them, and then things quickly escalated. Apparently, the seventh demon was a tier above most, and can't be renounced with spiritual faith. I admitted that I wasn't a Christian, but leaned toward agnosticism. I didn't think it was a problem because I answered that question in the introduction packet she gave me when I first walked in. 
Long story short, she berated me for 20 minutes, told me I was going to be stuck with this demon until the day that I'm a devout man of God, shamed me for coming to a Christian counselor without being a Christian, and charged me more than we initially agreed on. I think it's important to note that I don't think this is normal behavior for her. I obviously didn't know her very well, but the shift in her demeanor was huge. I honestly couldn't even recognize her when she got angry. Apparently she's been in business for years, and I can't imagine she would be remotely successful if she went off on every client that was simply looking for help, but didn't align with her point of view. I suspect it might have been induced, but nonetheless, I left her office hurt and angry. A week or two later, I decided to go out to Haiti to volunteer for disaster relief. I'm in my motel in Miami overnight with a flight out to Port-au-Prince the next day. That night, I woke up with sleep paralysis. I've read stories about it and realized it was important to stay calm and wait for the rest of my body to wake up. Suddenly, my legs were thrown out from under me across the bed. My torso felt like it was being pushed around. The next minute consisted of my body being thrown helplessly around the bed while I quietly prayed with all of my might. When I did, it ended abruptly, and I waited until the sun rose to relax. I ended up missing my first flight the next morning by a fluke. I booked another ticket the following day, but I was given the wrong time of my flight, and I missed that one as well. In the last six months, I have lost my jobs, isolated myself from friends, I am practically homeless, and I have had to file for bankruptcy. My ever so promising career in music is now gone and I am ashamed of myself because I never made it out to Haiti. I don't know if there is any merit to paranormal interference. I can chalk up the nightmare to my subconscious thoughts, the sleep paralysis to muscle spasms, and everything else to paranoia, but the unexplainable portions are, well, unexplained. Edit. Yesterday, I drove up to a spot on the mountain that I know pretty well. I crossed two creeks and walked a mile into the forest until I found a spot that I could easily recognize. I had the cross wrapped in a cloth that I had drenched in boiled salt water and let dry. I had also cleansed it myself before I left. I dug a small hole by the base of a tree and dropped the cloth-covered cross into the ground. I took out my Bible and read a select verse, prayed for it to leave me alone, and then addressed it directly. I demanded in the name of God that it will not follow me home or bother me anymore, and that it would be staying there. I've come back home and I've only felt better since. Granted, it's only been a few days, but I've been acting more like myself. My productivity has improved vastly. And most importantly, I don't feel burdened by that feeling of constantly being watched. It looks like that did the trick. Although, if I ever do need to get back the cross, I have the exact coordinates memorized. In the summer of 2008, when I was 13, my encounters with the unexplained began. I spent my days at home, alone, and everything was normal, until our dogs kept ending up outside. Then, things escalated. I began hearing unexplained sounds in the house, like footsteps pacing the hallway and faint whispers. My mom confirmed she heard them too, but warned me not to tell my religious stepdad. The rest of that year went by without incident, but 2010 marked the escalation of paranormal activity. That year, my twin sister and her friend captured a strange, smoky presence in a photo. My mom even heard a voice whisper, ouch, in her ear. But the most extreme occurrences were yet to come, and they happened to me alone. My first brush with sleep paralysis was relatively calm, but a series of inexplicable events followed. 
All in a row, in one event, a cup in my room tipped over on its own, a bird hit my window, my light bulb exploded, and the cup fell again. I was spooked, but I tried to brush it off. The final and most haunting incident occurred a week later during my second episode of sleep paralysis. As I lay immobilized, my room darkened, and then it turned blood red. A robed figure appeared in my doorway, its eyes piercing into me, radiating evil. The numbers 13 and 3 appeared, and then the paralysis ended. Later at church, we read Psalm 13:3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. I was chilled to the core, and to this day nothing has disturbed me more than that shadowy figure and those words. These events have left a lasting impact, and although I've had some mild paranormal experiences since then, nothing compares to the terror of that year. Even after losing my faith, the mystery of what I saw and felt still lingers. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there a long time. We went to visit them a few years back, and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college, and we were going to celebrate. She is also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town cemeteries, old abandoned houses, and even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings as we went to all these different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town, Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides only. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking, no shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side, where there were no houses, I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they had stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build upon it since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area although we couldn't see much since it was dark, and our only lights were the street lights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they illuminated. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but no one else saw it. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache. I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head, of Native Americans dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arms and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway back to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost as though I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver, like I was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. So we ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, 
It was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it, watching us as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day and found that it was home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood, and later thought that maybe, since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. Regardless, we have never spoken of the incident since. This happened when I was little, and I recently remembered it when talking to my parents this weekend about strange things we did as a kid. They told me that this one spoils them to this day, and after talking, I actually have one or two vague memories of it. This story took place when my family and I still lived in a small neighborhood in Alabama. We had moved into a small house that had a backyard, which connected to a small forest. I believe I was six at the time, and my younger brother had just been born. My parents got the house for less than expected, and were excited to start a new life in this quiet neighborhood. The first night at the house, my parents said they heard scratching coming from somewhere in the house. My dad said that he brushed it off as being an animal from the forest nearby, or maybe a mouse, and went back to sleep. It continued for several nights, though, and my dad eventually grew tired of it. One night, he decided to look and see what was causing the scratching noise. He found me kneeling at and scratching the door that led to the basement. He tried talking to me, but I would just continue to scratch. My dad watched me for a minute before I finally stopped scratching and walked back to my room. The next morning, he asked me about why I was up, and according to him, I didn't know what he was talking about. My parents took me to the doctor, and they told them that the most logical cause was that I was having night terrors, since it appeared to occur nightly. My parents accepted this as an answer, for a while. The thing was, I would only have night terrors in that specific house. Whenever we would spend the night at my grandparents' or I would have a sleepover at my friend's house, I never had these night terrors. And then there came one part that I somehow remember. It happened when I was a little older, around 9 or 10. I remember waking up in the hallway where the basement door was. I didn't remember getting up, and I was confused as to how I got there. I remember turning my head to see what looked like an elderly man. He had a kind of yellowish glow to him, and he was staring right at me. I don't remember feeling threatened by him, though. I think I might have fallen asleep again, because the next thing I remember is waking up in the hallway again, but this time it was morning. After the night where I saw the old man, my parents said my night terrors stopped. We moved out of that house several years later, when I was getting ready to go into the third grade. My parents brought up this story because they told me that, recently, one of our old neighbors had done some research on the house. What they found out was that an old man had unalived himself in the basement of that house years before my family had moved in. Our neighbor didn't tell them the full story over what led to that, but my parents believe that that might have been the old man that I saw that night. I'm now 20 years old and I'm enrolled in college. Neither I nor my parents have been back to that house since we moved out of it. In a way, I kind of want to visit, just one last time, to see if maybe I could find out about the old man. I'm just really curious about him. Either way, it was an experience I doubt my parents will forget anytime soon. I 
I've always been a believer in the paranormal, but I've also been a skeptic. I'm not one to jump to paranormal conclusions right away. With that said, this event messed me up, and it still keeps me up at night to this day. This happened almost a year ago. My girlfriend and I visited her parents' house, which was her old home in Alabama, specifically in Crenshaw County. For those that don't know, that's basically right in the middle of nowhere. The boonies, the sticks. Being from a large city myself in Southern California, I'm completely out of my element. I've already visited her parents once before with her. She has always told me that her house was haunted and that the woods were sketchy at night. But when I visited the first time with her, nothing happened whatsoever. So I chalked it up as some tall tale to creep me out. You know, freak out the city boy. That is, until we visited her parents the second time. Her father works in Montgomery for the weekdays, so he's gone a lot, and her mother had to be in Atlanta for three days due to a job. We were home alone for those three days, unless you want to count her cats as well. The one-story house is in the middle of absolutely nowhere, with the nearest house well down the road from us. One of those nights, around midnight, I'm sitting in bed with her completely asleep. I'm scrolling through Facebook and my Twitter and YouTube notifications when I began hearing what sounded like my girlfriend's voice. I turned to look at her to see if she was sleep talking. Nothing. She's quiet. I continue going through my notifications for a bit and I hear her again. But this time it doesn't sound like it's coming from her. It sounds like it's coming from outside, behind the bedroom wall, toward the same direction as my girlfriend, but much louder and echoey. I get up and I look around to see if there's a TV on or if the cats are making noises, even though the TVs aren't in the direction that I heard the voice coming from. But nothing. The TVs are off and the cats are asleep or just lazing around. I even checked her phone, which was on the nightstand to my right, in case it was playing audio or something, but it was just charging. I go back to bed with her and I continue going about my business, but this time I'm kind of looking out for the voice. This time I hear it again, but much clearer and louder, and it sounds exactly like my girlfriend's voice. It was for sure coming from outside this time, I know this because she was sleeping on my left, and toward my left is also the wall. On the other side of that is a clearing, and it's all dense woods. After this, I focused all of my attention to the loud voice to see if I would hear it again, and I'm looking at her to make sure that it's not her. This is the part where I internally started saying, I am not finding out what you are. I have seen way too many movies and YouTube videos and I'm not about to go out there and find out. I heard the voice one more time, yet this time it didn't sound closer, but just a little farther, which leads me to believe that it's something physically moving around the clearing bordering the woods. The scariest thing about the voice that really had me freaking out is that it was still clear enough that I started making out human speech, but it was messed up. Like it was speaking in phrases using my girlfriend's voice, but none of the words were making sense. It's almost like it was trying to speak English, but it was reversed. At that point, I did one final check around the interior of the house to see if all the doors were locked. My rational mind was thinking it was probably just some lost person in the woods, definitely not a skinwalker or whatever else. I made sure the curtains were closed and I just went to bed. I told my girlfriend the very next morning and she seemed rightfully freaked out, but we ended up just cracking jokes about it to cope. I posted this experience to Facebook about a week after and a lot of my friends threw around the thought that it could very well have been something paranormal. A friend of my girlfriend's who studies cryptozoology as a hobby asked me a ton of questions relating to the incident, and basically flat out said, yeah, that's a Wendigo. I don't know how credible of an opinion that would be. I'm inching into believing it though. 
because what I heard that night was exactly my girlfriend's voice. I swear I could make out my name in that garbled speech. I'm not too sure on that much, but it was like it was luring me into the woods. Whatever it was, it got my girlfriend's voice, pitch, tone, patterns, everything, just right enough for me to listen, but not enough to get me to go out there with it. Of course, I was looking at her, so I knew it wasn't her. Who knows what I might have done, I guess, if she hadn't been in the room with me. I haven't been back since, but we are planning to go back in October and go to Disney World with her family. I'm hoping that whatever it was isn't there anymore. This started a few years ago, and so far, there's been no explanation of the things that keep occurring. I live in the southern United States near a national park, in a fairly rural area. So our first guess was that this had to be some sort of wildlife. Something that was scaring us for no reason other than us getting into our own heads. However, after a ton of internal explanations, we finally came to the conclusion that we had none. The first thing that occurred was fairly brief. It was shortly after the death of my uncle, who was fairly close to us before he passed. He was a veteran, and while in the army, he had volunteered to have shock treatments that altered his personality greatly. This had occurred during the Vietnam era while he was stationed in Germany. My grandmother was in the bathroom and I was in my room just playing a game. When out of the blue, the wall sounded as if somebody was beating on it, trying to get our attention. Three loud knocks, then nothing. We were worried that something had happened to our neighbor, an elderly woman, and that she needed our help. But after we went outside to check, there was nobody there. Fast forward a few months, we started hearing footsteps on the roof. They started out light and easily explainable, something along the lines of a cat walking on the roof. We had seen it happening a few times, so we thought nothing of it, until they started to get a bit heavier. Eventually, it sounded like something that weighed a lot more than a cat, even more than I did, was sprinting across the roof, every night from one end of the house to the other. Things got worse after that, we started to find dead animals around the property. And while some of it could easily be explained as roadkill, we do have a lot of problems with people speeding due to a lack of police presence in the area. There was also a ton of random things that we would find dead nearby. We would find crows and ravens laying in our backyard, the occasional snake. And one time we found a deer that apparently walked onto our property and dropped dead. There was not a single sign of a wound or anything when we found it. We started to hear things inside the house soon after, seeing things out of the corner of our eyes that would vanish before we could turn to get a good look at it. Scratching mainly, we've put rat traps and every kind of poison we could think of in our walls, but there's no sign of vermin. We would hear whispers at night, like somebody was trying to talk to us. We're rational people. We checked to see if there were any cracks in the windows or door frames that could make the wind blow in and sound strange. But from everything that we've checked, there doesn't seem to be any opening that could make that noise. One of my old friends, who before this story was as skeptical as I was, was sitting in my living room playing something on our PlayStation when he thought he saw somebody walk past the window. It doesn't sound too scary, right? Well, no, until you consider that my windows are nearly 10 feet off the ground. Our house is raised to allow water to pass underneath it to prevent any water damage. And the place that he claims to have seen the man wasn't near any stairs. He came to visit another time about a month later. We were sitting and talking to one another 
when he said that he needed to use the bathroom and he left to do his business. He goes and when he comes back, he's pale white and terrified. When I asked him what was wrong, he was evasive. So we just got in the car and drove down to Sonic to grab some food and talk. That's when he told me that he saw somebody staring at him from my room as he walked back, smiling at him, and that it had yellow eyes. He doesn't come around anymore. At least he doesn't stay after nightfall. I don't know if what he claims is true or not, but it still scares me to think about just how scared he was. He's just not the type, so I'm inclined to believe him. I've tried cleansing the house with sage. We've got a crucifix in every room now. Near the front door, we have three. We've even duct taped the back door shut, and we have it locked to be absolutely certain that nothing can get in. We just don't have any explanation. This is a true story that happened to me, which I am weary to share, as there have been many times where I have opened up about this, only to be met with ridicule. I hope you'll take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off Highway 82 in Alabama, called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends, like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residential hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I will share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was my girlfriend, me, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand and the camera in my right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and the light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish white illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction, over the course of two frames, she is half behind the door, and in the next frame she's gone. My heart felt like an ice cube ran through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody that I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger girl, maybe younger than 10, hair parted in the middle, unusually large forehead, and some apparent deformation or disorder. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. I know, I know, but it's the truth. This is where it gets weirder. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that the windows grow back. If you do any damage to them, they'll just grow back over and spirits will follow you home. Well, I broke a window. I was laying in bed one night at about three or four in the morning. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was and very comfortable. 
Out of nowhere, this immobilizing tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of about 20 seconds. Once it fully covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. It gave me shivers. And for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped and it left me on the verge of tears. I don't know what possessed me to say that, but it was really emotional and terrifying. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to the legend, it makes sense. Either way, it's the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. Back when I was 18 or 19, I had decided to go to church. It was a church in Cherokee, Alabama, and I went with my once friend, we'll call him Joel, and his family. I had gone in, and Joel and I were directed to the basement with all of the other people who were under 20 to do something. Some kind of class, maybe. I forget what it was. But maybe five to seven minutes in that basement, I get the most blinding headache and excuse myself outside to get some air. I wait for everybody to get done and we head back to where Joel and his parents lived. The whole ride, this headache is just not going away. I stayed at their house maybe an hour or two while this headache gets worse and worse. I decide to attempt to drive myself home to Crooked Oak. As I'm driving, the headache becomes all but blinding and halfway home, in the night, on this dark road, I stop at this tiny little backwoods church. The pain is so immense I can't focus on anything, at which point I was pretty much wishing to be struck dead just to escape it. I stumbled out of my jeep, and I landed on the first bit of grass I could find, and I pretty much passed clear out. After a good stretch of time, the pain left me, I went to drag myself to the jeep, and with my senses returned, I realized that I was laying on someone's old grave. I don't know why it helped, and of course I didn't do it intentionally, but there it is. To this day, I refuse to go near that church. I don't know what's in that basement, but I don't want to encounter it again. When I was a kid, I lived in Alabama, way out in the country. My best friend at the time lived about a mile away, and my older brother and I would go over there daily during the summer. Near his property is a dead forest. All the trees are there, but they never have any leaves. It's pretty darn creepy to begin with. Sometimes we played in there, but we never went very far. One day, my brother and my friend, let's call him Sam, wandered off while I was messing with a turtle, and they disappeared. Once I was done playing with the turtle, not hurting it or anything, I went around the property looking for them, until I thought I saw one of them head into the woods. By this time, it was late afternoon and getting darker. I ran to the woods, but I couldn't see them. Then I heard what sounded like them talking, deeper in. I followed the voices, and they kept seeming farther and farther away, as though I should have been getting closer. And then, they stopped. And suddenly, I felt really scared. At that moment, I realized that the sun had already set, and it was starting to get very dark. So I ran all the way back to Sam's house. My older brother and Sam were playing Nintendo in his room and thought that I was still in the backyard playing with the turtle. I never did figure out what I was chasing in those creepy woods. 
but I'm kind of glad that I never did. I used to live in this old house with my grandparents out in the middle of nowhere in the south of Alabama. The closest town was maybe 30 to 40 minutes drive away. The land we lived on was my pop's family land, and it was passed down through many generations. I was in middle school when all of this took place. I have always had problems sleeping at night, so my grandparents let me stay up at night. This one night, I remember to this day, because my best friend, who's basically my sister, was with me at the time. We were in the second living room, what I call the family room, and we were just having fun talking, girl sleepover type stuff. The family room connected to the dining room. We had the windows open because it was a hot summer night in this old house that didn't have air. My friend and I were playing, and out of nowhere, I felt this unknown energy. For some reason, everything went dead silent. I looked at the open window, and I saw the curtain blowing. I thought it was the wind, but I was so wrong. The wind wasn't blowing, not at this time. None of the other curtains were billowing. Out of nowhere, I see the silhouette of a woman. The description I would give of her would be like a 1950s housewife, with her dress and straight hair, but the end curled out. I looked at her for so long, trying to wrap my brain around what was going on. I was a little scared of her, but I didn't feel like I was in danger. She disappeared, and when she did, the curtain quit blowing and everything went back to normal. I thought I was crazy, but then my friend looked at me and said, you saw that too, right? I nodded yes. Both she and I went to the window to see if anybody was out there and to see if the wind was blowing, but no to both. What really freaked us out was how far out in the middle of nowhere we were. There's no reason that anybody else would even be out there. And after that, I've never seen her again. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there, and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings. Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you were in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom, and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. 
The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe ten, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm going to have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. 
Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the boards settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now my twin's room was the coldest in the house and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so... We weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, Ouch! Very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, 
I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later. My second episode of sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. Thirteen and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. Something is wrong. I'm staying with some family in a very rural area. The closest stores are super far away. Hours, actually. We got here late Friday, and we're leaving late Monday. Today, my cousin and brother happened to see a drone that was following them on the land that we have here. It's about 200 acres. Everyone was a little bit confused and didn't really like it because it's creepy and an invasion of privacy on our private property, but we disregarded it, figuring that somebody on their land nearby was just bored and didn't realize they were on ours. It's now 2.25 a.m. on Monday, and my parents are together outside relaxing near the house on this swing chair thing, 
just listening to the nighttime sounds. I was inside with my grandparents, in bed with my cousin and two siblings, when I got a sudden phone call. Seeing as it was 2 a.m., I was very confused and didn't think that anybody would be calling me right now. I grabbed my phone, realizing it was my mom, so I immediately answered, making sure everything was okay outside. There are plenty of weird insects, poisonous things, snakes, coyotes, wolves, things like that around here. And my mom gets scared very easily. She says in a concerned voice, Dad and I just saw something flash over our heads, really low down on us. We don't know what's happening. So I told my cousin and my brother and sister and everyone seemed pretty freaked out because that's very unusual. We all run out to the trees by our house and get to my parents, who are staring up at the sky and a bit far away, panicking. As everyone was outside staring around at the sky, we managed to point out multiple drones or something strange in the sky, flashing getting farther away and then closer. We saw one, then another, but then we saw up to five and some were disappearing. For a moment, we thought, oh, stars. But why would my parents have something shining on them? And why would they hear whirring sounds if it was just a star? We drove what we call a donkey. I don't know what it's actually called. It's a small vehicle like a golf cart, but not. Anyway, we drove that into the field that it was closest by. We shined a spotlight on where it was, right above the trees. It started coming towards us, and then I saw something weird by it that suddenly went fast towards it, then stopped and fell into the woods. So we started driving away and went back home. But then my dad drove over there with my cousin and siblings and my mom, and then my grandma came out on the porch. We were waiting for them to come back while they looked for drones in the sky themselves. I went inside because I was getting bugs all over me, and I hated that. I start hearing this weird noise from outside the house, and then I hear a yell. The dog started barking and howling. Then I heard my mom tell my grandma that she had just heard my sister scream, and that something's up with the cows that my grandparents own. After a bit, my family all came back, and they're all still outside, but my sister came in to explain what was up. With tears in her eyes and fear on her face, she said they went out there, and everything was absolutely fine. But then the cows started acting weird. And then, she heard it. A loud woman, screaming. The UFO was getting closer, flashing green and red, so they drove really fast back to us. Everyone is so confused and freaked out. We have no idea what's happening. Why these things are watching us. Why there are so many. I'm interested to know what anybody else might think it is, because I am definitely freaked out. My first sighting was when I was 10. It was a massive floating ship shaped like a huge manta ray. When I saw it, I felt like I had been on it for a while, but I shook off that feeling and ran home. The memory surfaces periodically. Sometimes I think I can remember what the inside of that ship looks like, and I remember not being alone there, but I have little idea who I was with. Much later, I saw a craft landing in the cow pasture at my parents' house in a rural country. I feel compelled to go inside the house, and it's like I forgot what I had seen. I lost a few hours of time that day. I always assumed I must have watched TV, but later I realized I literally have no memory of the next few hours. Later, I began seeing lights in the sky, and I would ask aloud, Are you here for me? The light would bob and weave up and down, left to right, where it would flash brighter for a moment. Again I would go inside and soon after I would lose memory of what I was doing for the next few hours. This happens often still to this day. I have a lot of theories and sometimes I remember parts of conversations with people about my life, my personal feelings, my aspirations, 
good conversations about how I can improve my life, but I can't remember any faces of the people I talk to. I do benefit, though, as my life has steadily improved over the past ten years, so I'm not fearful about the encounters. I'm aware that they are taking place. I just don't know if I'm ready to remember more yet. When I was around eight years old, around 1995, I went to visit a friend's house just up a path and through a courtyard from my house, about a minute away. On the courtyard is a set of flats which creates an archway that you have to walk through. As I walked back home and through the archway, I heard a low humming noise, and I looked over my shoulder to see a typical film-like shaped spacecraft. The round disc-like shape with the dome on top and the circular lighting. The lights didn't shine as such as it was daytime, but I can now only explain them as looking like LED lights, which is why they were so noticeable in the day. The UFO is small, no bigger than about three feet and a foot and a half high. I think it's coming for me. At this point, I'm so scared I start running for home. I'm about 30 seconds away, but the corner to the path is coming up. I'm still trying to watch this thing chase me, and as I get to the corner, it's just behind me, and the low humming is deafening. I can feel it within me. I have to take my eyes off of it for a second to turn the corner, and as I do round the corner, the light, whether it was natural sunlight or the LED type lights, went really bright and sounded like a jet plane thundering overhead. I look up as I round the corner. It's above my head, so close that the wind it created whipped up my hair. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. No visual sign of it, but I heard that jet plane noise and low humming noise move away from me. I get home and tell my mom and dad. They don't believe me and say I must have mistaken a bird. I told my friend the next day, and she rolled on the floor laughing. I stopped telling people after that, but I can still remember it like it was yesterday, and I still can't shake the feeling that it was coming for me, even though it was so small that there's no way I would have fit in it. I just can't explain the fear. I was six or so, I think it was 1998. My grandparents and I were heading to Southern California to see family. It was dark, but not late, so it had to be winter. I get car sick, so they drug me up, and when I wake up, I see a tall hill. On top of the hill, I see a saucer with a spotlight. It scares me, but I just go back to sleep from fear and Dramamine. Next time, it was 1999. I was playing on the computer, and I looked out the window at about 11 p.m. I see a craft above a house outside my apartment complex, spotlight on the roof. I watch it for a while and decide to go to bed just before the ball drops. In 2001, I got a stuffed cat for my birthday. I left it outside, and my mom got mad at me and told me to go get it. I go outside and look for it. I look up and across the street, and I see a huge ship. Two football fields across at least. Bright orange lights, flat back and round. I don't know why I keep seeing these things, and maybe I don't want to. I have two encounters. The first one happened roughly 10 years ago. My father, two brothers, and I were on our back porch in Georgia. We lived in the country and literally had no neighbors for two miles in any direction, 
so we were out there. We were looking at the stars on a clear night, and we noticed a very bright star. After looking at it for a few minutes, it shot across the sky, stopped, and shot straight up, stopped again, and then shot to the right, stopped one more time and then went up diagonally and disappeared. Every time it shot across the sky, it was moving a good five to six inches as far as we can see in the sky, so it was easily moving hundreds of miles. I don't know if it was aliens or the government testing something, but it was amazing. The second encounter was my father, brother, and I driving down the road near our house. This happened five years ago, so about five years after the last encounter. It was nighttime, and again, we live in the middle of nowhere on backcountry roads. We saw in the mirrors, and by turning around, a red rectangular light heading down the road from behind us, heading our way. It was going slightly faster than us. It passed overhead, and it was completely silent. Obviously, we stopped at this point, and it continues on down the road. Once the road ended, it went above the tree line and literally shot away, at a very high rate of speed, into the sky. We never saw it again, and couldn't make out what was causing the light. There was just this rectangular-looking light coming from it. It was also very large, much larger than the car, approximately the size of two school buses if they were welded together side by side. If you have any idea what this could have been, let me know. This happened to me back in 2013. I was 18 at the time. I was a healthy, normal woman by all accounts and lived in a suburb of South Florida. Just at that juncture in my life, I was moving up north to UF, which is in Gainesville. Aside from the university, it's a very boring town, mostly nothing up there. I had noticed that before moving there and during my time there, once a month, always on the same night, I think the first Sunday of every month, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Without fail, I couldn't sleep. I would toss and turn all night. Sometimes after those nights, I would wake up with something strange on my body. Once on my lower spine, right on the spinal cord, I woke up with a large red bump, perfectly centered. It wasn't itchy like a bug bite, and it was unlike a pimple. Another time, I awoke with a scar across my lower abdomen. It was long, and unlike a scratch. It was brown, like it had been cauterized. But it left my body within a day or two, like a scratch might have. On one such Sunday, my boyfriend happened to be spending the night. It was my parents' rule that he would sleep in a separate bedroom, but before he went off to his room, he laid next to me in my bed for a little while and we talked. He was saying something when, suddenly, he went quiet and looked behind him. I asked him what was the matter, but he shrugged it off. He went to his room and we both tried to sleep. However, like usual on these nights, I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. A feeling of dread prevented me from sleeping. I got restless and decided to go sleep in the room with my boyfriend, hoping that I might be able to relax with him there. But still I couldn't sleep. I would nearly doze off, only to awake in a fright, which was really uncharacteristic of me. I gave up and went back to my own room until I suddenly gave in and fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I told my boyfriend that I couldn't sleep all night and that I felt like something was coming to get me. He told me at that moment, the previous night when he suddenly fell silent mid-conversation, it was because he thought he saw something outside of my window. He said that for whatever reason, the first thing that came to his mind was aliens and that it froze him with fear. He also told me that shortly after I had returned to my own room in the middle of the night, he was disturbed by a loud static noise and felt vibrations in the air. After a few months, these routine, monthly sleepless nights stopped and they never returned. I still don't know what it was all about or if it was even anything at all. But that night put both of us on edge.
When I was in probably the fifth grade, I was staying up and watching YouTube on my iPad, and I decided that I should probably get to sleep. I think it was either 1.30 or 11.30. I can't remember. I just remember 1s and 30 being on the clock. I remember laying in bed and suddenly I heard something. It sounded like the little hovercraft things with blades on them that you see in the movie The Incredibles. But yeah, I heard that and I just froze and sat there, not knowing what to do. So I climbed out of bed and looked out the window. I saw this little light moving in the sky, and then it stopped for a minute. And then, after a bit, it kept moving forward. But there was still this little light that kept flashing random colors, from red to yellow to green to blue and back to red again. I know this is gonna sound weird, but it was almost hypnotizing to watch. Not only did it change colors, but it changed shape as well. After every flash of color, it would change shapes. And then, the next morning when we woke up, our satellite was gone. I'm not shitting you. There were no storms that night, or any strong winds at all, and no reason why it should have been missing. So before I tell you the story, let's get one thing straight. My dad is a stubborn, no bullshit type of old guy. He thinks aliens and ghosts are all a load of crap, and he wouldn't make something like this up. We're from England and we live in the Midlands. And one night during the late 80s, my dad and his friend are out making hay in the tractor in a field. When all of a sudden, a bright flash of light appears right in front of them. And there's a giant ship hovering in front of them. He's always ever told me it looks just like you'd imagine a spaceship, disc-shaped with lights spinning around the edge. He and his friend had only just taken in what they were seeing before it darted off in the opposite direction toward the next village. So my dad gets on to CB radio, because you know, if you didn't have one of those in the 80s then who even were you? And he radios another farmer friend in that village, and he sees it too. He even radios his wife, who then wakes up the kids, and they all see it too, before it darts away into the night. I always remember my dad telling me the story when I was a kid, although out of character for him to do so. I just thought it was some cool story he made up. But a couple of years ago, his friend comes over, the one who was in the tractor with him. And I just happened to mention it in kind of a, oh, you know that old story dad used to tell me kind of way and his friend remembers instantly and begins to describe it exactly how my dad did, which really makes me believe that it was true. My dad still doesn't believe in aliens. He believes it was a spacecraft made by the government to spy on us and that they made it to look like a typical alien spaceship so people wouldn't think it was the government. God knows. All I know is I believe it happened and it's cool as hell. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down. And then there was a walkway in the middle with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question. Why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes, 
I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb, and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears, as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. When I was little, probably eight years old, my family and I were driving back home from my grandparents' house late at night. They live in the countryside, surrounded by orange groves and corn stalks. I remember being so excited to be out at night. There was no moon though, so looking out the window was a little bit scary, since I was looking directly into darkness. I could only see a little bit ahead of me because of the car headlights. When we were passing the corn stalks, I saw a person with black eyes that glowed from the headlights. This person had a weirdly shaped body. They weren't wearing any clothes either, but I don't remember seeing any other body parts besides arms and legs. When I saw it, I got this overwhelming sense of fear. I was so scared that I slid down in the seat to hide from it when we passed by. My parents didn't see it, and I never mentioned it until years later. I'm not sure what it could have been, and I'm still trying to figure that out. Maybe it was a child. Maybe it was my imagination. Or maybe it was an alien. I've never seen anything like it after that. It was just that one time. But it definitely stuck with me. On two occasions, my friend and I were in separate rooms of our housing complex. This friend lived on the second floor, while I resided on the fourth. The first time the humming started was one night, at around 3.35 a.m. This humming noise started to fill the room, and at first I thought it was my roommate snoring. I thought this until the noise kept going and getting louder. It was so loud that my head was hurting and then it slowly went away. I thought I was going crazy, until my friend texted me from the second floor and was like, what the actual hell was that? I thought nothing of it until about a month later when it happened again. This time, it got much louder at a much faster rate. It was so loud that my bed and belongings started to shake. This time, it was around 12.30 on a weekday. I was pretty scared, not gonna lie, and after two minutes of this sound and shaking it quickly went away. The weirdest part is that the first time the sound went from left to right, getting louder and quieter. The second time it was down and up. Anyway, I'm not a big believer in aliens, but I don't really know what to think about this. Maybe it was. As a side note, my social media months before was only alien spam, even though I never talk about them or search for it, not even for space. Once I openly started talking about aliens and researching Orion's belt, all of the alien spam went away, and nothing even related to aliens comes up on my feed anymore. Kind of backwards from how that's supposed to work. Anyway, I just want to hear others' thoughts about it.
A few years ago, while visiting Grandma with family from all over, and while eating lunch, we get into normal family talk. Ghosts, aliens, stuff like that. An aunt was explaining to me that as a child, she's the youngest of three, so she's about 60 now, she was walking down the road next to their house. As she was nearing the corner, she noticed a man with his back to her. She said that his skin looked human, but a bit of a gray color. And he turned around and looked right at her. That's when she saw that he had huge yellow eyes, all yellow, that were a bit rectangular in shape. She turned and ran home. She and my father on separate occasions saw what they thought were satellites, but they were traveling the opposite ways that satellites normally travel, and they hit each other and both ricocheted back in the directions they'd come from. They experienced a lot of things in their childhood home. Fast forward to my aunt being married with two kids, they all experienced stuff in their family home. I always think about what my aunt said she saw that day while walking. A hybrid? What was it there for? As a child, and somewhat now still, I'm scared of aliens. I have gotten a bit better with a few of their faces, but I still have night terrors of being abducted, and a lot of times I'll wake up throughout the night and my boyfriend will tell me that I woke up all night long, but I never remember doing so. Also as a kid, and to this day, I see shadow people and hear things. I've been touched by things that I can't explain, mainly because I can't see what's touching me. Long before we started dating even, my boyfriend's mom said that when I would come over to hang out, it would seem as if the ghostly actions in the house would pick up. But still, I think about what my aunt saw. I want answers, but I'm slightly afraid that I'll never get them. Newfoundland is an alien hotspot if the stories that I hear are any indication. Almost everyone I know has some story about when they lost huge chunks of time and were missing, usually for about a day, but it can go up to a week. I've never heard of any violent encounters, but a lot of I was frozen and couldn't move for a bit due to a light in the sky kind of stories. It's a pretty good assumption that if aliens do exist, they stalk my family. My dad has stories about being frozen on beaches, being watched in his sleep, and a weird story about the stars changing configuration. My mom has stories about meeting aliens, and she has a few accounts of what they look like. I might tell those stories one day, but I really feel like this is a good introduction to the types of encounters my family has had. For me, it all started when I was about 13. There's nothing overly remarkable about me, other than being in a military family, and I was more precocious than most. At the time, I was living in my dad's hometown, maybe a solid kilometer up the hill. My house was a raised bungalow, meaning that all the first floor windows were about 10 feet off the ground. My window faced the front yard, and was probably the only one that didn't have some kind of bush in front of it. Basically, I had a good solid view of my outside. One night, I remember being woken up fairly abruptly at around one in the morning. Not unusual for a 13-year-old. So I thought, go get a drink, probably pee, go back to bed. Except, when I tried to move, I couldn't. Some people describe the feeling of an overbearing weight that prevents them from moving. This wasn't that. It was like my whole body was asleep complete with that tingly feeling and an utter lack of ability to move. I wasn't sleeping in a weird position, and aside from having maybe an extra blanket on the bed, I couldn't figure out a reason why this would be happening. The only thing I could move was my head, as my neck felt asleep, but not enough to completely prevent movement like the rest of my body. So I flopped my head to one side, and that's when I saw it. In my window, Roughly in the middle was a disc-shaped object. It hovered maybe a foot away from the glass and didn't move. This is remarkable for anyone who's been to Newfoundland, 
where 40 km per hour winds are the norm basically every day. The disc was maybe three feet in diameter, and the better part of a foot tall. It let off this low-grade, almost LED-like hue. It reminds me of those horrible blue Christmas lights. The thing had three thick, prominent ridges on what I assumed to be the front of it, which was facing me. From the middle one came a red light, and the thing didn't have a lens. It just kind of emanated from this thing. It split into a wide vertical pattern, and it's like it was scanning my body. When I moved my head, the disc was beaming around my belly button area. As soon as my head flopped, with maybe a second or so delay, it moved the scanning laser to my eyes. For maybe five seconds, I stared rather uncomfortably into this horrible red light, and it burned. I wanted to close my eyes desperately, as it felt not dissimilar to staring into the sun. But they wouldn't move. I tried to yell, but I couldn't say anything. And, much like staring into the sun, you see little else. After the five or so seconds, the light turned off, and I could just make out the disc object flying off down the road toward the ocean. I was awake for maybe ten more seconds before I fell asleep. For full context, this all happened in about 20 seconds, give or take. I need to point out that this happened in 2003, in rural Newfoundland. At that time, there were no such things as drones. Drones were the terrifying flying machines that the US was sending to bomb the shit out of Iraq. They were something I'd only even seen recently on the TV, as those big, white, plain-looking things. I have no real explanation for this other than possibly aliens. I had tried to talk to my family and classmates about it, but they mostly called me a loony and laughed. Eventually, that night passed from me trying to tell people about it to thinking nobody will ever believe me, so why bother? A month, maybe two passes, and my life carries on as usual. The only real difference is I become shit at math. I was a top student in my class, always pulling best grades for most of my school life until that point, given the math isn't all that hard. But I really started to suck. My grades went from 90s to 60s, often 50s, and sometimes even failing in the math department. Often, I was failing in the math that I was able to do not even four months prior. Nobody was concerned for some reason, but that was a frequent theme in my teen years. So, I was now just the kid that had fallen from grace. Still had amazing grades in everything else, just never again in math. So, one night I remember being woken up. Again, my body felt like it was asleep, and again I had some control over my neck. But I remember this like I remember a dream. But way too many details for it to be normal, but I'll get to that. The first thing that hits me is the blinding white light. It was coming from outside my window, brighter than stadium lights, and coming from who knows where. But I knew it was close to my house. All I heard was a low, growling hum coming from outside. In my room were two of those discs I had seen before, shining a wide red light all over the room, which dampened the sheer brightness of the light outside enough that I could see. Then I see one of them. It walks into my room, and I remember being scared-ish, but largely indifferent. It was easily over 12 feet tall, and was uncomfortably skinny. Its arms and legs were way too long for the tiny torso that it had, about the size of a child. They were multi-jointed in at least seven places that allowed it to fold its arms and legs enough that it could fit into my room. I have no doubt that if it were to fully extend all of its joints, the thing could easily top 20 feet. It had hands which had too many joints on the fingers, way too many fingers, and no thumbs. They were in a half circle around its pretty round palm, and generally unsettling now that I think about it. It had a head, a huge head, but it lacked any real eyes except for maybe tiny pinpoints where a massive socket would otherwise be. It had no nose, no hair, no real chin, and two holes where our cheeks would be. I'm guessing that it might be a mouth, but hell if I know. The head was thin, because of course it was thin, and resembled somewhat of an oblong pancake. 
The whole thing had white skin with a gray undertone, or what I assumed to be such given the lighting in the room. The creature held out its hand, and instinctively I held it. It walked me out of the room, stark naked, and was leading me to my living room. When I get into my hallway, I see all the doors in my house are open, and there are a dozen of these things just sort of mulling about. I remember one looking into our linen closet, one walking into our basement, and another unscrewing a light bulb. All over the house were the discs that gave everything that faint, red tint, and the huge stadium lights from outside, making it look like broad daylight, but with a slight red tint. In the dining room was my mother, also stark naked, kind of just standing there, as two of these creatures were in my kitchen doing something. Lying on the couch in the living room was my dad, again naked, with three of the creatures looming over him, with a bunch of weird tools in their hands. I can assume doing some kind of procedure. I remember asking, where is my sister? To which I got the reply, outside, from the creature holding my hand. I'm still unsure if this was telepathic or if the creature said something out of its uncomfortable holes, but I accepted that as good enough of an answer. As I walked by my dad, I could see that the creatures were fiddling with him, poking and prodding him. I remember being concerned, as I know that my dad had just had a surgery, but I again got the feeling that it would be fine. The creature I was with placed me in the corner of the room, facing the wall, and I sat down cross-legged without much issue. The creature then left and I was there for about a minute or so. All I can remember from that time is a few details. Above me was one of the discs, shining its broad red light. But I had the faint blue as well, giving my vision an odd hue. The only other distinguishing feature I remember is the silence. The piercing and utter silence only broken by that soft, low, growling hum coming from outside. I remember then waking up, back in my bed, no worse for wear. All I think is, damn, that was a realistic dream, and went about my day. The only difference is I had, and still have, a small lump on the back of my neck the size of a split pea. It comes and goes, sometimes I feel it, and sometimes I don't. And a few times I've squeezed it, and some dry, powdery substance came out. I just assumed it was some weird medical thing, but if it ever happens again, I might try to get it looked at. A few years go by, and my dad and I were chatting. We got on the topic of aliens, one of his personal favorites. I tell my dad about the multi-jointed creature thing, and before I can even get to the point in my story where I reach the living room, he goes, Man, I had a dream like that bunch of skinny white men with hoods were poking me right after that surgery. There was a red hue all over everything. I remember seeing them sit you in a corner and you just sort of stayed there for a bit. Crazy dreams, huh? I asked if it seemed real to him and he said, well, yeah, I've had those dreams ever since I was a kid. The white guys in hoods never do anything interesting. This was the only time. Our brains are weird, aren't they? I've brought it up a few times since, but I don't get a whole lot more than what I've already told you. My sister has somewhat of a similar story, but she remembers like three seconds of it. I have maybe two minutes. The best guess I have is aliens, and this is far from the only time that I've encountered these creatures, but I'll save that story for another day. I come from a relatively small island in the southern part of Denmark, with approximately 6,000 inhabitants, which is where all of the following sightings have taken place. Most of the island is covered by fields. I have no doubt that these events are 100% true, and not just made up. One has to understand that in such a small community, if you report seeing UFOs or other such things, you risk being labeled as the crazy guy seeing aliens and stuff and could potentially be publicly ridiculed and made fun of, especially as a younger person. 
All of these people told me that they kept shut for many years in fear of being called out. Therefore, local people would likely not share such stories if they weren't 100% true. Why risk being publicly made a fool of for a lie? As they've grown older, I guess they begin to care less about what people might think. The first story was my father. Around the mid-80s on a warm summer night, my father was in his 20s and sat outside looking at the night sky. Suddenly, a white orb appeared. Across the night sky, it appeared to be about the size of the moon and moved slowly from north in a straight line directly south. He never talked about it due to the fear of being called crazy. A couple of days later, he was visiting my grandmother's hair salon when an elderly woman started describing the exact same sighting. He then shared his own experience with my grandmother and the lady. It turned out that four or five people had seen this orb moving across the sky. The second event was described to me by a close friend of my father's and is somebody that I know very well. This was around 2005 or 2006. He was standing in his kitchen around midday. The window in his kitchen overlooks a large field. At one point, he looks out his window and sees a large white glowing orb, similar to the one described by my father. But it wasn't moving. It just hovered close above the ground. And then it suddenly shoots up into the sky and is gone. He also kept shut about it for several years before telling anybody. The last sighting is to me the strangest. This happened in around 1990. The person who told me the story is a good friend of one of my own friends. He told me that at the time that he was 11 or 12 years old, he was playing in his room with a friend. He lived on a small farm and from his room, he had a good overlook of some fields. He could see relatively far away from where his room was. At some point, they both looked out the window. Out in the middle of one of the fields stood a large structure shaped like a pyramid. It appeared to have an opening or an entrance. They stared at it as the opening began to close. As the entrance closed, the pyramid suddenly shot up into the sky and was gone. He told me if it wasn't that he had had another person see it with him, he never would have told anybody about it because it just sounded too crazy. Still, they both kept shut about it for several years and he says that he hasn't told many people about this encounter. What do you think? Maybe somebody has reports of experiencing something similar in Denmark. A few nights ago, around 5.30 in the morning, I noticed a green light in my room near the wall across from me. I had all of my lights off and was just looking at my laptop, which I closed when I noticed the light. The room was completely dark, no lights on, door closed, blackout blinds, no phone flashlight on. When I saw it, I wasn't scared, but I felt almost hypnotized and placated by its presence. But I did want to take some video to make sure that the object or being was real. I saw the light moving around my room for approximately 30 minutes. Sometimes it moved slowly and organically. At other times it flitted away quickly and the movement appeared similar to a drone. And sometimes it stopped in one place for several seconds. At first it seemed like a single point of light, but at points in the video it splits into two pieces. At some points a red light flashes very briefly as well. I also didn't notice or see this at the time of the event, but in some of the videos there appear to be grayish figures around the edges or corners of the frame, or the entire screen will go from black to gray and vice versa. I held the phone still while filming it and just waited for it to come in and out of frame. In the last video that I took, the light flashes insanely quickly, appearing in one place, disappearing, and then reappearing in another spot in less than a second. I don't really remember waiting for it to go away or anything. I just stopped taking video and went to sleep. What do you think?
I wanted to share a scary experience my family had when vacationing at the Caribbean Beach Resort in August of 1995. As a quick side note, I was born in 1992, so I don't remember anything from this trip. This is all coming from my family. Also, I do not know the exact room number at the time. We have family videos from this trip, but I haven't found them yet. If I find them, I can confirm the room number. I want to say that it was on the island of Aruba, but I'm just not sure. A quick setup for the story. This was a big family vacation because it was my aunt's birthday. The first room consisted of my brother and I and my mom and dad. The room directly next door consisted of my three sisters and their friend. Farther down and around the corner was my grandma and my aunts. They did not experience anything that night, so they don't matter much at this point in the story. It all started at 2 a.m. on night two of the vacation. My mom shot up awake and ran for the door, screaming about a giant bug. During this time, my dad says that there were a lot of colorful lights shining through the windows. But they said there was a meteor shower that night, which might explain the lights. Eventually, my dad was able to coax her back to bed. She said all she remembers is seeing a huge bug. I asked her recently about this, and she said that she saw the silhouette of a giant bug. It could have been an alien, I guess, but she doesn't know. This is important, because my mom is the one who said it could have been an alien, but she doesn't know. My mom is super religious and never cared for crypto stuff, so I can't see her lying about this. After a while, they go back to sleep until around 4 a.m. My dad wakes up in mid-air at the side of the bed and dropped, hitting his head on the nightstand. He even had a large bump on the back of his head. He said he was in the air for a few seconds before falling. He was pretty shaken and spoke to my mom until about 5 a.m. That's when my sister called the hotel phone. My sister called because they had coordinated to get up early that day and my sisters couldn't sleep. My mom said, that's fine. Your father kept me up all night talking about the weird stuff that happened. And my sister yelled, weird stuff happened to you too? We'll be right over to talk about it. Once they came over, they discussed what had happened to them. At the exact time that my mom woke up screaming about the giant bug. At 2 a.m., my sister Christy woke up to my other two sisters, Kim and Trisha, screaming. Kim was on the floor and Trisha was still on the bed. Christy was trying to understand what happened, but neither Kim nor Trisha would calm down enough to speak coherently. Eventually, they calmed down enough to tell her. When Christy asked what happened, Kim said, I don't want to say it. Trisha, you say it. And Trisha said the same. It was as if they both experienced something so traumatic that night that they didn't want to relive it. Finally, Trisha got the courage to try and explain. She would start to explain it and say, It was horrible. We were... And then her mouth would get contorted and her speech would slur. She couldn't get the words out no matter how hard she tried. Same with Kim. Whenever they would try to say what had happened to them, their words would just scramble. So flash forward to the morning. Before going to Magic Kingdom for the day, we all had breakfast at the Hard Rock Cafe. During breakfast and the rest of the day, my mom, Kim, and Trisha would randomly start crying. My mom said it was the weirdest feeling of being so small. She said she felt like a dot. After breakfast, we were in the Magic Kingdom. We were going on rides and such and eventually found a letter in my stroller that definitely wasn't there before. The letter was in French, but they couldn't figure out what it said. They brought it to a few French couples they had met, but every time they were told, sorry, this doesn't make sense, I can't translate it, or I don't want to read this to you, it's too weird. Eventually they lost the letter and it was never translated. And that's really it. Aside from a crack in the ceiling of the hotel that wasn't there the night before, I think that sums up the odd experience. I was three at the time of this occurrence, and my brother was five. We were both untouched and unbothered. If I was old enough to understand, I would probably have that letter to this day. My sisters don't remember anything from that night. They thought about going to see a hypnotist or something, 
but they were too afraid of what they might find. My main reasoning for posting this is that I wondered if anyone else had a similar experience. I'm sure there is an answer to what happened that night, but it's probably something we'll never know for sure. I'm not really sure what this was, but I vividly remember a situation that happened to me when I was younger. I do remember watching some kind of alien horror story on Animal Planet or something at night about how a lady went to space and then had something in her stomach that was alien-like and it exploded or something. I don't exactly remember everything. I had seen this before I went to bed a couple of nights prior. This was maybe when I was younger than 10 years old. And I slept with my mom in my bed, and we lived on the second floor with a window by my head. I remember waking up and all of a sudden seeing green light, and I heard some weird noises. I was so scared. I tried to wake up my mom, but she wouldn't answer. I know we had a light by the back side of the apartment, because we had a porch. But this was like a green color that kept turning on and off, pulsating like every 5 to 10 seconds. I also heard a whirring sound, but not really. I do remember that the light wasn't like the porch light. It seemed much bigger and more illuminating through my window, but I couldn't check because we had an awning. I don't remember much of it since it's been over 10 years, but I just remember being so scared. I don't know if I imagined it, but I do remember waking and just covering my head with the blanket wishing it would go away. It seemed like it was hours before it stopped, and then I went back to bed and woke up again. Luckily, nothing has ever happened since, and we've moved apartments. So, for context, it was pretty late at night, but I don't remember the exact time. It was around 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. I was with my boyfriend in the car. We were just sitting and talking before he went home. But as we were talking, I was sitting in the passenger seat, so my body was direct toward him, and the road that I used to live on was behind him as well. We're in mid-conversation, when I see a figure walk past on the other side of the road, going toward a park I lived near. It was just right around the corner from that road. This figure was pretty tall. Not inhumanly tall, but definitely taller than the average person. And it was completely all white. Not glowing, but was a super bright white that I could see perfectly, even though it was dark. It looked as if it had no clothes on, but honestly it didn't need it. I didn't see any details on the body, or body parts, or any muscle definition. The limbs were thick in the sense that they just looked like cylinders, but wasn't thicker than the body itself. The neck wasn't inhumanly skinny, but definitely a bit thinner than I think a normal person has. The head was rather small, but again, not inhumanly small, just oddly proportioned for the height of this thing. The whole time, I was speechless. It wasn't a small glance. I stared at this figure walking for a solid minute or so. My boyfriend didn't realize since we were mid-conversation until he saw the look I had on my face, and by then it had turned the corner. He didn't see it at all since his body was directed toward me. I went to a family member about it who lived with me at the time, and she had a story of her own about weird paranormal experiences at the park that it was walking to. Hers was a bit different. It was the same with plain white figures, but instead it was more than one, and their heads were spinning. She and her friends ran home immediately after seeing them. Obviously I can't confirm her story because I wasn't there, but I thought it might provide context. If you have any idea what this might be, let me know.
The mind is a funny place, and it creates a lot of weird, untrue stuff. Here are two related true stories or dreams that have stuck with me for more than a decade, vivid enough that I flip-flop in my mind whether they were even real today. My family had a house in a rural part of Massachusetts, and a train track into the woods, maybe a half mile from us. One night, I had a dream of a light shining into my wooded bedroom window and figures outside. That same dream appeared to fast forward, and my family and I were all walking in the middle of the night down our rural street. We didn't talk, but I remember feeling the base of the back of my neck was off, felt stiff in the dream. The dream skips forward, and we were at the train tracks. My family and I again say nothing, quietly walking down the tracks. They feel real. I've walked these tracks many times, hanging with friends during the day or sneaking out at night. At the time, I knew them well. We enter the woods some way down, thick, dark brush in the dead of night. My family is with me. We move quietly. I have a grandma who is elderly and a sister who is well abled but has Down syndrome. We all traverse hyper-realistic woods arriving at a clearing. Wind rushes in my ears and I hear my grandmother screaming. There are bright lights, so bright. There's a feeling of wind as I open my eyes and I am at the field at the bottom of my parents' home. The sound disappears and I remember feeling like I had wires out of the base of my neck. I rub it, but there's nothing there. My family and I walk up the hill and I wake up. My mom says she didn't sleep very well that night, but that's about it. I chalk it up to a random dream. Two or three years later, my family camps in Lake Placid, New York. We rented a towable pop-up trailer. As I dream one night, I feel the rush of wind. I wake up and see light shining into our trailer. It gets closer and I remember nothing. A loud gust of wind, my mother and I both shoot up from the dead of sleep in our trailer, both staring at the door. We look at each other and discuss it. Like, thunder? Maybe? We go outside. It's a clear night. We joke about aliens a little bit and go back to bed. I've been uneasy since then at times over these thoughts. Years and years later, I can still remember the feeling of wires sticking out of my neck. How vivid the dream was of walking down the road. The feeling of missing time. I'll never know if these are dreams or coincidence or something else, but it's happier to think that they're just dreams. I've had sleep paralysis before. I get it like once every two years. But every time that happens, I wake up in the same spot where I'm paralyzed. The first time I slept on the couch after a long day at school and saw a dark figure opening the window and walking toward me. I woke up at the same spot I'd fallen asleep in and nothing happened. The second time I was sleeping in my room, Friday night, and I saw a woman with a knife coming for me and cutting my hand. I woke up in the same spot I'd fallen asleep in and again, nothing happened. But the third time is something that I think is pretty insane. The third time, I don't think it was sleep paralysis at all, but a memory that came back. I was at my girlfriend's house and I was sleeping on my left side. My girl is next to me on the right. She was awake. She tries to wake me up, but I fall asleep again. And then I felt like I was lost in a deep, forgotten memory. My girlfriend and I were messing around with our speaker that we have. It has multiple options like Bluetooth and aux. While trying to change stations, we're engaging with a new sound like space radio or something like that. When you hear a lot of strange single noises of different electronic devices, it's like that. The second that hits, I'm getting kicked back by gravity into the bed, laying down, paralyzed on the right side of the bed, when my girlfriend is sitting on my right at the edge of the bed, looking straight down, with her hand leaning onto the bed, paralyzed as well. When this happens, I hear a loud, deep, mixed voice, 
not humans, but speaking in English, which is not my native language. It was inside my head, but it was also so loud that I can't think of anything else. All I hear, like it's some really important message, is the world, the will, over and over again. It was like they wanted me to remember this somehow, but chose to bring that experience to me just at that moment. The voice in my head was strong, but I shivered. I felt like somebody was tasering my head. I felt like I wasn't in control. I somehow understood that my brain couldn't take it anymore, and I was trying to wake up, but nothing helped. Until I suddenly wake up, stressed out and reaching for my girlfriend, asking her if I was talking in my sleep or moving or doing anything that showed signs of a nightmare, but nothing. She says I was sleeping like a baby right next to her. I found nothing about the world, the will, but I believe that it was a real encounter. My girlfriend doesn't remember any of it, but it's terrifying just to think about it. After all, it might be a memory of mind control or aliens or something. Or it could just be a really bad sleep paralysis dream, but I don't think so. The red light that was around this whole situation is the fact that I wasn't at the same side of the bed, and I always wake up at the same spot I get paralyzed in when I have sleep paralysis. I have two reasons for sharing this story. One of them is to see if anyone else has encountered this message, the world, the will. Maybe it's something from a movie that I heard once, or maybe it's something else. The other reason, I guess, is just to see if anybody knows what I might have experienced. If you have any ideas, please let me know. I have a story that I want to share to see if anybody has experienced anything similar, or just to find some explanations. I was seven, maybe eight years old. I'm now 22. I was in my bedroom getting ready to sleep. My mother was in the other room, waiting for my dad to come back from work. The door of my bedroom was closed. It was summer, I guess, because I remember having the windows open. The room was dark with no light, except for the moonlight and the light coming from our garden. As soon as I laid in bed, I remembered that I wasn't really tired. I wanted to stay up with my parents. I looked towards the nearest wall, maybe 30 centimeters from the wall. I can see this clear figure, slowly standing and looking at me. I started screaming my lungs out and in a couple of seconds, which felt like an eternity for me. My parents got scared by the screaming. They ran in. As soon as they ran in, the figure disappeared and I'm just staring at a wall. I'm terrified and I start crying and I tell them everything. They decided to call the nearest priest to bless the house and me. Anyway, I remember this figure really clearly, even though I was very young. The same night, I described it as an alien with a black coat, like the death. That's a quote. In fact, it was this little figure, maybe one and a half meters tall, dark green or gray, with a black coat on his body and a hood on his head. The eyes were long, oblique, and black. I could see his face thanks to the lights coming from the windows. I remember a small mouth, and that's it. The fact is, why would I ever imagine an alien this way? I mean, I've never seen movies with aliens in my life, I've just never been interested. And, as I remember, if you asked a kid to draw an alien, he would probably draw something really tall without any clothes and big black eyes, you know, the like. But, for some reason, that's what I saw. I know I didn't make it up. I know what I saw. I just don't know what it was. I'll never forget that summer before entering seventh grade, sometime in July. 
It was a Wednesday night, leading into the early hours of Thursday. The previous evening, my family and I had watched an old episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Later that night, I awoke, lying on my right side, my eyes still closed, enveloped in silence. In those days, none of us used fans to help us sleep. I was awake, but simply waiting to drift back into slumber. But curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to open my eyes. What I saw next, I will never be able to explain. A being was right beside my bed, fixated on a plush bear I kept with me. This creature resembled everything I had heard or seen on TV about aliens. Shorter, with pale gray skin, and those haunting, huge, black, slanted eyes. The shock I felt at that moment is beyond words, especially since I was only about 12 years old at the time. Pulling my covers over my head, I felt a rush of warmth and coolness over my body, which I realized later was probably shock. Fear paralyzed me. Too terrified to scream, my mind raced with a million thoughts. What if my family came rushing into my room? What would this creature do? Was it going to kill or abduct me? Had it already done so and it was just returning me? The experience was so awful that even recounting it now sends shivers down my spine. Summoning my so-called courage as an 11-year-old, I decided to try and frighten it by thrashing my legs under the covers. But nothing happened. I stayed hidden, the terror lasting for what felt like 12 hours. Finally, I heard a strange noise, a crisp sound that seemed to surround me. Lasting only about two seconds, it was something I had never heard before, nor have since. Somehow, I knew they were gone, as if the sound was their transportation leaving. I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night, and it took me a long time to even share this harrowing experience with my family. They didn't believe me at first, but my mother occasionally brings it up now, suggesting that it might be the reason I suffer from insomnia, and she might be right. At the age of 10, I had my first encounter. It was with an enormous floating ship, shaped like a massive manta ray. The moment I laid eyes on it, a strange sensation washed over me, as though I had been aboard it for some time. I quickly brushed that unsettling feeling aside and fled home. The memory has a way of returning to me now and again, bringing with it hazy recollections of the ship's interior. Vague and fleeting, these memories also hint at companionship aboard the ship, although I have no concrete sense of who might have been with me. Years later, another sighting occurred. This time, I saw a craft landing in my parents' cow pasture out in the countryside. What happened next is still puzzling to me. I was irresistibly drawn inside the house, and all memories of the sighting seemed to vanish from my mind. A gap in my memory appeared, several hours for which I have no account. Though I once assumed I had simply watched TV during that time, I eventually came to realize that I had no recollection of those hours at all, TV or otherwise. More recently, I have begun to notice strange lights in the sky. Whenever I ask aloud, are you here for me? The lights respond, bobbing and weaving, or momentarily flashing brighter. Each time this occurs, I go inside, only to lose memory of the subsequent hours. This pattern continues to this day. All these experiences have led me to develop various theories. Occasionally, fragments of conversations come back to me, discussions about my life, my emotions, my goals, and my constructive insights on personal improvement. Though the faces of my conversational partners remain a mystery, these encounters have had a positive impact. My life has gradually improved over the past decade. These mysterious meetings don't frighten me. I am aware of their occurrence, and I acknowledge their tangible effects on my life. What I don't know is whether I'm ready to remember more. The experiences are there, 
just beyond the edge of recollection, and I remain in a state of uncertainty, wondering what might be revealed if those memories fully resurface. A few months ago, an experience at the end of an exhausting work shift left me questioning reality and my own sanity. I'm a nurse, and I had just started a new job at a nursing home about 45 minutes away. The pay was good, and the hours suited me, especially the 16-hour weekend double shifts. But on one particular weekend, my routine was disrupted when they asked me to work both morning and evening. That Sunday night, my relief was late. I wasn't too bothered since I was already behind on charting. But then things got busier, as a resident fell and had to be sent to the ER. After handling the situation and the additional paperwork, I finally left work at about 1 to 2 in the morning, ending up with nearly a 20-hour shift following a 17-hour shift the day before. I was drained, but I felt okay to drive. My car is too small to sleep in, and I couldn't get a hold of a friend. My route home is scenic, with twists, turns, and views of the lake, which usually helps me keep awake. But that night, I realized I had left my glasses behind. My vision was blurry, but I was too exhausted to turn back. As I was driving through a wooded area, a bright light, like a spotlight, caught my eye. It was coming through the trees, as I followed the road, I came across a thin figure, dressed in skin-tight black clothes, kneeling over a deer by the side of the road. The spotlight was directed at him. I remember thinking how strange it was, but my thoughts were slow and my eyes were straining without my glasses. I slowed down and rolled down my window, asking if he needed any help. The figure turned and I was frozen by what I saw. It wasn't human. It was tall, with a large head and enormous eyes, like an alien depicted in stories, but not small and frail. It began to approach my car, and a voice in my head commanded, Sleep. I blinked, and suddenly it was gone, along with the deer, and it was nearly 4 a.m. My car was parked, and I had no memory of pulling over. I tried to call my sister, but I ended up calling my workplace instead. The colleague who answered stayed on the line until I got home, under the pretense that I had fallen asleep and didn't want it to happen again. I tell myself that I must have fallen asleep, that it was all a big hallucination born of exhaustion. But deep down, I'm haunted by the thought, the knowledge, that it was real. The fear of what might have happened, whether from falling asleep at the wheel or encountering something completely inexplicable, still lingers. I haven't shared this story with anyone, as it terrifies me just to think about it, but it's a memory that refuses to fade, leaving me forever wondering, what if? The memory of a particular dream from my childhood continues to haunt me to this day. I was around six years old when I first had it, and now, at 22, I find myself recalling it once every few months. Unlike most dreams, where the details blur and fade over time, every part of this one has remained vivid in my mind. The dream begins as many dreams do, with me waking up but something feels different this time. A bright light is streaming through my window, illuminating my garden. I can't quite make out the source, but it seems to be coming from the area where our treehouse was. I glance over at my brother, who's still fast asleep, unaware of the strange occurrence outside. As I look back at the window, my heart skips a beat. A figure is now visible in the garden, silhouetted by the bright light. Its proportions are all wrong, 
It doesn't look human. Panic sets in, but I find that I can't move to wake my brother. I look back out the window, only to be met by two massive eyes pressed up against the glass. I try to scream, but no sound comes out. Then, suddenly, I wake up in my own bed, calm and not sweating. This in itself is unusual, as nightmares typically leave me drenched in sweat. But there's something even more unsettling about this recurring dream. It's not just confined to my sleep. It invades my waking life, too. Whether I'm sipping tea or sitting in a lecture, the entire dream can suddenly play out in my mind. Even stranger, the mornings after I recall the dream, I often discover a random cut or two on my body, already mostly healed. These physical marks add an eerie layer to what might otherwise be dismissed as just a childhood nightmare. I can't shake the feeling that there's something more to this dream, something unexplained and strange. It's a puzzle that I can't solve, a memory that lingers. And sometimes I wonder if I'll ever figure out what it really is. Back in 2013, when I was 18 and living in a suburb of South Florida, something inexplicable began to happen. As I was preparing to move up north to attend the University of Florida in Gainesville, I noticed a strange pattern. On the first Sunday of every month, without exception, I found myself unable to sleep. I would toss and turn all night, plagued by this feeling of dread. Sometimes, these sleepless nights would be followed by odd discoveries on my body. For instance, I once woke up to find a large red bump on my lower spine, right on my spinal cord. It wasn't itchy like a bug bite, and it wasn't like a pimple either. Another time, I found a cauterized looking brown scar across my lower abdomen, only for it to disappear in a day or two, like a scratch might have. One particular Sunday stands out in my memory. My boyfriend was spending the night, and though my parents insisted that he sleep in a separate room, we spent some time talking in my bed before parting for the night. As he was speaking, he suddenly fell silent and looked behind him, his eyes wide with fear. When I asked what was wrong, he shrugged it off, but his expression stayed in my head. Something was definitely wrong but he just wouldn't tell me. That night, the dread was more intense than usual. I was restless, and I finally sought comfort by joining my boyfriend in his room, but I still couldn't sleep. After nearly dozing off and then awakening in a fright, I returned to my room and eventually fell into a troubled sleep. The next morning, my boyfriend shared something that startled me. He revealed that when he had suddenly stopped speaking the night before, he had felt a presence outside my window. Aliens were the first thought that came to his mind, although he didn't know why. It froze him in terror. He also described hearing a loud static noise and feeling vibrations in the air shortly after I had gone back to my room. A few months later, the monthly sleepless nights ceased, never to return. To this day, I wonder about all of those occurrences. Were they merely coincidences or something more? My boyfriend and I were both on edge that night, feeling something that we couldn't explain. The strange physical marks, the sleepless nights, the fear that seemed to be over nothing. They all remain an unsolved mystery. A baffling chapter in my life that continues to interest but also unsettle me. One night, something strange happened that both my sister and I still remember vividly to this day. We were asleep, and I suddenly woke up. I couldn't pinpoint why, but I managed to wake my sister as well. 
In the dim room, we both saw two figures that resembled decorated generals standing at the side of our beds. They looked kind of like the drawings of Pleiadian aliens that some might be familiar with. Once my sister was awake, something even more strange occurred. A portal opened up on my side of the bed, accompanied by a vessel and a track. The soldiers invited us in a warm and inviting way that we were encouraged to hop in. They seemed very kind, and their words were something like, let's go have fun. We got in the vessel, just like it was an amusement park ride, and it was kind of like Peter Pan or It's a Small World at theme parks. Not the same theme, but that kind of a ride. It was bright and vivid, filled with flowers and details that were incredibly realistic. Even though I often looked down at the ground during amusement park rides to see if they were real or not, this experience was unparalleled in its authenticity. After the ride, my memory starts to get a little hazy, and the details escape me. I can't remember anything more about what happened after the ride ended, but the impression that it left was profound. Living close to NASA, and having seen a TR-3B, it's an experience that really makes me wonder if there's more to the universe than we know. The memories of that night are etched in both of our minds. Neither my sister nor I have experienced anything like it since. It feels like a dream, but more real and tangible. And we both insist to this day that we were awake. Could it have been an encounter with another dimension or beings from another world? I'm left pondering what it all means, and I'm eager to hear others' thoughts on this experience. I find myself grappling with something that occurred six years ago, an experience that my then-boyfriend, now husband, went through. Though I've pushed it to the back of my mind for years, something a week ago caused it to resurface, and now it's haunting me. Six years ago, my husband woke me up in a state of utter fear, sweating and shaking. Though he initially struggled to explain what had happened, he eventually told me about a mysterious person he had seen at the end of our bed around midnight. Despite my first thought being sleep paralysis, he assured me that he was fully awake and ready to defend himself. The being was unnaturally tall, needing to crouch in our basement where we slept. My husband described hearing a calming voice in his head, telling him that the being meant him no harm. He reached out to my husband, saying hello and greeting him by name, and promised that they would meet again. My husband then felt as though time had started again, realizing only then that it had seemed to stop at all. The visits continued for months, with my husband becoming less and less frightened each time. This mysterious entity, and my husband, developed a friendship, engaging in profound discussions. The being, whose name I cannot recall, answered my husband's questions on various subjects. The encounters typically occurred around midnight, and though they felt brief, they would last until between 1 and 1.30 in the morning. Suddenly, the visits stopped, and it was as though they had never happened at all. My husband ceased waking me up or mentioning the experience. Now, six years later, I find it challenging to recall every detail, but the memory of those strange encounters remains vivid. The oddness of the experience and its abrupt end weigh heavily on my mind. My husband has never mentioned it again, and I have refrained from bringing it up for the fear of appearing insane. The question of whether he has genuinely forgotten or if something more mysterious has caused the memory to fade is driving me crazy. This matter has become something that I need to understand. It's literally keeping me up at night. Marked by Joseph K.
Growing up in Thornhill, a small, unassuming town in Scotland, I was used to quiet, starry skies. But one evening in late autumn changed my perspective on the night sky forever. It was a typical chilly night, and I was walking home from my friend Tom's house. The streets of Thornhill were usually deserted after dusk, making my solitary walks home peaceful, but a bit eerie. As I strolled, I admired the clear sky above, endless stars I could enjoy without the glare of city lights. That's when I noticed something unusual. At first, it was a faint glow near the horizon, almost like the northern lights, which we rarely saw this far south. The more I looked, the more curious I became. I stopped to watch, thinking it was just a trick of the light, or maybe some late night military exercises from the nearby base. But I'd seen those lights before, and these were different. They pulsated, glowed more brightly, then dimmed back down again. I felt like I was watching a dance of some kind. Over and over, in almost a rhythm, the lights would pulse brighter and then dim down. I couldn't tear my eyes away from it, and maybe something out there knew that I was watching. Because soon, the pulsing turned into zigzags, abrupt stops, sharp turns, movements that no aircraft on Earth could pull off. The more I watched, the more unsettled I became. I was disturbed by how unnatural it all was. This was not something ordinary. I was watching something that shouldn't exist, maybe even something I shouldn't see. And the moment that thought entered my mind, all of the lights converged directly above me, like they knew I was there. Like they were saying, we see you. I shook my head, snapping myself out of the trance I'd been in for who knows how long. Moments, days, it all felt the same to me then. Just as I looked away, the entire area around me lit up in the brightest light I had ever witnessed. The light transformed a pitch black night into glowing daylight and brighter even than that. I looked around, frantically trying to find one single person who could see this. One shared experience, so I knew I wasn't going crazy. But the streets were empty. All the windows were dark. Nobody rushed out. Nobody turned on a light. It was as though this thing was happening just to me. Like the set had gone dark on the normal world, and I was under a spotlight of a cosmic show that I never should have been a part of. My mind raced. Do I run? Do I stay? Do I scream? But I didn't have to make that decision, because just as suddenly as it had appeared, the light went off, the night settled around me again, and the crafts, or whatever they were, shot off into the sky and disappeared. The difference between the blinding light and the darkness made it hard to adjust again, I stood there for maybe five minutes, just trying to see straight. Once my night vision returned and everything returned to as normal as it could be, I ran. I ran home and I didn't look back, and I certainly didn't look up until I got there. I got back safely. At least, I think I did. I say that because, other than the panic in my throat and the several minutes of vomiting that ensued once I had a chance to settle, I thought everything had gone back to normal. I felt okay. Shaken, yes, but otherwise all right. But that was a week ago, and since then nothing has been quite the same. I'm obsessed with this experience, I can't stop thinking about it, literally. At work I think about it, when I'm with friends they tell me I seem distracted. Every ounce of free time I have I spend researching, thinking puzzling over what that could have been. And I haven't slept the same since. The nightmares, long halls, bright lights, impossibly tall, elongated beings. It's nearly every night now, and every morning I wake up feeling exhausted 
and achy, like I've been hiking all night in my sleep. Or, or running. Trauma, I thought. It's just a trauma response. It will pass. That's what I told myself. But it hasn't passed, and it hasn't stopped. And this morning, I woke up to find the smallest pinprick on my arm, almost like an injection site. I know this sounds crazy. Believe me, I know exactly how it sounds. But I feel like they marked me that night. And ever since, they've been coming back, taking me somewhere at night. Even saying that out loud makes me feel nuts, but I don't know how else to explain any of this. I don't know why I'm telling this story at all. I guess I'm just really scared, and I wanted someone else to know about it. Markings After a Dream by Doug H. I've always had vivid dreams, but nothing like the one I had last Thursday night. It was more than a dream. It felt like a visitation. It was a really unsettling experience that left a mark on me, quite literally. In the dream, I was in my room, but it was different, distorted. It was like the walls were breathing and the space was bending. There were figures around me, not human. Their features were blurry and shifting. They were tall and had elongated limbs and large, unblinking eyes that seemed to pierce into my soul. Other than that, I couldn't really make out much, but their presence was overwhelming. I mean, truly suffocating. I couldn't move, I couldn't speak. I remember trying to scream, but no sound came out. It was as though I was trapped within my own body a silent observer to these bizarre beings who were studying me, their long fingers moving over me like they were examining some kind of object. And then suddenly I woke up. My heart was racing, my sheets were soaked in sweat. I sat up trying to catch my breath, trying to convince myself that it was just a nightmare. But then I noticed something that sent a chill down my spine. On my arms and legs were marks, reddish imprints that looked like symbols or some kind of cryptic language. They weren't painful, but they were precise, too deliberate to be random. I had no idea how they got there. I hadn't had any injuries, I hadn't been outside, and my room was locked from the inside. I took photos of the marks, hoping they would fade away and proved to be some kind of bizarre allergic reaction or something equally mundane. But deep down, I knew they were connected to that dream. They were too specific, too alien to be anything else. Over the next few days, the marks began to fade, but the memory of the dream and the fear it instilled in me did not. I couldn't sleep properly. I kept waking up at the slightest sound. It was like I was always waiting to see those beings in my room again. I tried to find explanations for both the dream and the marks. Sleep paralysis, stress-induced hallucinations, psychosomatic responses. I clung to these rational explanations like a lifeline, but I knew that none of them truly fit. The dream had been too real, the marks too precise. As the days turned into weeks, the incident started to feel more like a distant, unsettling memory. The marks disappeared completely, leaving no physical trace of their existence. But I can't forget what happened. I can't forget that night. And to this day, it really bothers me. Midnight Encounter on Old Mill Road by Emily S. I remember it like it was yesterday. 
I was driving home late one night after a long shift at the hospital. The route took me down Old Mill Road, a narrow, winding path surrounded by dense woods. It's the kind of road you would expect to see in a horror movie, isolated, dark, and eerily quiet. It was around 2 a.m., and the only light came from my car's headlights, cutting through the thick darkness. I was exhausted, mind half on autopilot, when something caught my eye. At first, I thought it was the reflection of my lights on an animal's eyes, or maybe a trick of my tired mind. But as I drove closer, I realized it was something else entirely. Hovering just above the tree line was a craft unlike anything I had ever seen. It was large, maybe the size of a small house, and shaped like nothing I could compare it to. Not quite round, not quite angular. The most striking feature were the lights. They weren't like any aircraft lights I knew. These were vibrant, shifting in colors I couldn't even name, pulsating in a pattern that was almost hypnotic. I slowed my car to a stop, my eyes fixed on this inexplicable sight. The craft made no sound, which was the strangest part. You'd expect something that size, that close, to make some kind of noise, but there was nothing, just the sound of my own breathing and the gentle hum of the car engine. I don't know how long I sat there, staring. It could have been minutes or hours. Time seemed irrelevant. The craft started to move, not with the jerky motions of a helicopter or the smooth glide of a plane, but in a way that seemed to defy physics. It hovered upwards, then shot off at an angle, disappearing from view in a blink. The rest of the drive home was a blur. I was in a state of shock, trying to process what I had just seen. I kept telling myself that there had to be a logical explanation. Maybe it was a military drone or some experimental aircraft, but deep down, I knew this was different. This was something not human made. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those lights, the way they moved, the eerie silence of the craft. I considered calling someone, the police, the local air base, anyone. But what would I say? I had no proof, just a story that sounded like something out of a science fiction movie. The next day, I checked the news, searched online for any reports of strange sightings in the area. There was nothing. It was as if I'd been the only one to see it. I talked to a few neighbors, casually bringing up if they had seen anything unusual the night before. They hadn't. As days turned into weeks, the intensity of the experience began to fade. Life returned to its normal routine. But there was always a part of me that looked back at that night with a mixture of fear and fascination. I drove down Old Mill Road many times after that, half hoping, half fearing that I would see the craft again, but it never reappeared. I still wonder what it was I saw that night. Was it something from another world, a glimpse into a reality beyond our understanding? Or was it just a figment of my overworked, tired mind? Whatever it was, it changed the way I looked at the night sky. I find myself now gazing upwards more than ever, searching for answers, or perhaps another glimpse of the unknown. But the skies over Old Mill Road remain just as inscrutable as they had always been, leaving me with a memory that haunts and intrigues me in equal measure. had a very strange experience a few weeks ago. The evening started out normally enough. Everything seemed ordinary as I went to bed. However, at about three in the morning, I awoke. Midnight awakenings are not uncommon for me, so I didn't give it much thought. I took a peek at my watch and confirmed that it was approximately 3 a.m. But while I was getting comfortable again, I noticed a figure standing in my room, motionless, 
as though it was looking for something. It sensed my motion, I suppose. What's weird is when I saw it, I immediately went to sleep. I mean, it was like somebody just snapped their fingers and I was out. The following day, I went to the area where I had seen the figure, but nothing was out of the ordinary there. Nothing out of the usual transpired. It was not a dream. That much I know for sure. I always sleep with my light on, so everything was extremely clear and bright. Every last thing is crystal clear in my mind. You sometimes just have to wonder about stuff like that. The Fleeting Visitor in the Sky by Sarah Kay. I'm an amateur photographer, always chasing that perfect shot. It was on one of these pursuits, on a clear and sunny day, that I unwittingly captured something extraordinary, something that defied explanation. I had set out early, hoping to capture the soft hues of the sunrise over the hills near my hometown. The sky was a brilliant blue, clear except for a few wisps of clouds. I was focused on farming the landscape, adjusting the settings on my camera for the perfect exposure. After a couple of hours, I decided to review the shots I had taken. That's when I noticed something odd in one of the frames. At first glance, it looked like a speck of dust on the lens, but as soon as I zoomed in, I realized it was something else. Suspended in the clear sky was an object, its shape blurred due to its apparent speed. This object, whatever it was, hadn't been visible to the naked eye when I took the photo. I would have noticed something moving that fast. It was only in the frozen moment of the photograph that it became apparent. The object was elongated, almost cylindrical, but the details were indistinct, lost in the motion blur. Intrigued and a bit unnerved, I quickly scanned through the other photos I had taken that morning. There was no sign of the object in any other frame. It must have been moving at an incredible speed to appear in just one of the hundreds of shots I had taken. I showed the photograph to friends and family, asking if they had any idea what it could be. Some suggested a bird or a plane, but the shape and the speed didn't match. Others joked about drones or extraterrestrial spacecraft, but their laughter didn't quite mask their unease. Determined to find an explanation, I posted the image online, on photography forums, and local community groups. The responses varied widely. Some people offered more logical explanations, a bird flying too fast for my camera to capture clearly, a distant aircraft caught at just the right angle. Others were more fanciful, suggesting everything from secret military technology to visitors from another world. I even reached out to a local university's physics department hoping they might shed some light on the phenomenon. They were intrigued, but ultimately they couldn't provide a definitive answer. The object's speed and indistinct shape made it impossible to identify with certainty. As the days passed, the mystery of the photograph consumed me. I found myself staring at the sky, camera always at hand, hoping to catch a second glimpse of the mysterious object, but it never reappeared. The sky remained just as clear, just as empty, as it had been on that day. The photograph became a topic of much debate among my friends and acquaintances. It sparked discussions about the unknown, about the vastness of the sky above, and what secrets it might hold. But as time went on, the fervor died down, and the image became just another unsolved mystery, a curious anomaly in a world full of them. I still look at that photograph sometimes, wondering what it was I captured that day. Was it something mundane? A trick of light and speed? Or was it something more? A brief glimpse into the unknown? The rational part of me leans toward a logical explanation, but a small, perhaps imaginative part. Can't help but wonder if it was something more, 
a fleeting visitor from the skies, caught for just a fraction of a second in my lens. The Geometric Mystery of Harper's Field by Michael B. I've been a farmer in Harper's County for the better part of 20 years, and I thought I'd seen it all. But what I found one morning in July changed that. It was just after dawn, the sun barely peeking over the horizon, casting a soft golden light over my fields of wheat. And that's when I saw them, crop circles, large and complex, etched into my land. The patterns were unlike anything I had ever encountered, perfect circles interlocked with intricate geometric shapes, creating a design that seemed almost mathematical in its precision. I remember standing at the edge of the field, my coffee cup forgotten in my hand, staring in disbelief. I had heard of crop circles before, of course, they were usually dismissed as pranks or explained away by natural phenomena. But seeing these up close, feeling the eerie stillness that hung over the field, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to this. The circles were enormous, spanning many yards across. The wheat was bent at perfect angles, not broken, as if gently pressed down by an unseen force one that knew exactly how much force to exert without totally harming and damaging the field. I walked through them, trying to make sense of the pattern, looking for any sign of human interference, footprints, tire tracks, anything, but there was nothing, just the undisturbed earth and the inexplicable shapes carved into my crops. I called a few neighboring farmers to come and take a look. They were just as baffled as I was some joked about aliens and otherworldly visitors, but their laughter was tinged with unease. None of us could fathom how such a complex design could be created overnight without a single witness or clue left behind. Word spread quickly, and soon people from all over the county, and then the state, came to see the crop circles. Researchers, UFO enthusiasts, even a few skeptics, all trying to unravel the mystery. They measured angles, took samples of the wheat, speculated about electromagnetic fields and atmospheric phenomena, but no theory seemed to fit. The circles remained a mystery. As the days passed, the story attracted more attention. Local news stations ran segments on the crop circles, and I found myself fielding calls from journalists and curious onlookers. But despite all the theories and speculation, no satisfying explanation was ever found. Eventually, the crowds mercifully thinned, and life in Harper's County returned to normal. The weed in the circles eventually straightened somewhat, but the pattern remained visible until harvest. I plowed over the area, sowed new seeds, and watched as fresh wheat sprouted, erasing the last traces of the mystery. But the memory of those crop circles stayed with me, Sometimes, late at night, I would find myself gazing out over the fields, almost expecting to see new shapes forming before my eyes. I wondered if whatever or whoever created them would return, but they never did. I still think about those crop circles, turning the memory over in my mind like a puzzle missing half its pieces. Were they a message, a sign, or just a random act of extraordinary precision? I guess I'll never know. But one thing's for sure, they left a mark. Not just on my land, but on me, my perception of the world. In the quiet of the countryside, under the vast, open sky, it's hard not to feel the presence of something larger, something beyond our understanding. And every now and then, when the wind whispers through the wheat, I can't help but wonder what secrets it carries.
The Lost Hours on Fletcher's Pass by Daniel T. I have never been one to believe in the unexplained or the supernatural, but something happened to me on Fletcher's Pass that I can't quite make sense of. It was a night that turned my understanding of reality on its head, leaving me with more questions than answers. I was driving home from a late shift at the diner. Fletcher's Pass is a lonely stretch of road that cuts through dense woods, known for its lack of streetlights and its eerie quiet. It was around 3 a.m., and the road was deserted, illuminated only by the moon and my car's headlights. As I drove, I noticed a light in the sky. At first, I thought it was a star, but it was too bright, too low, and it seemed to be moving, slowly at first, but then picking up speed, heading in my direction. I slowed the car, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The light grew larger and brighter until it was all I could see. And then, everything went blank. One moment I was staring into this blinding light, and the next, I was sitting in my car, still on Fletcher's Pass, but it was daylight. I looked at the clock on the dashboard. It was 7.30 in the morning. Hours had passed in what felt like seconds, and I had no memory of any of it. I felt disoriented, confused. My first thought was that I must have fallen asleep at the wheel, but that didn't explain the light or the missing time. I didn't wake up at 7.30, it was as though 7.30 was the next moment after seeing the light. I checked my phone for missed calls or messages, but there was nothing. It was as if those hours had simply vanished. I drove home, trying to piece together what had happened. I had a headache, a pounding in my temples that wouldn't fade. When I arrived home, I found that everything was as I had left it, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I tried to go about my day, but the experience lingered in my mind. I told a few friends about it, but they were as baffled as I was. Some joked about alien abductions, but I don't think they were really kidding. Everybody seemed concerned, not judgmental, but confused. In the days that followed, I tried to find logical explanations. Maybe it was a meteorological phenomenon a trick of light and tired eyes, but none of the theories felt right. The light had been too bright, too focused, and there was still the matter of the missing time. I went back to Fletcher's Pass several times, both during the day and at night, trying to trigger some kind of recollection or find some clues as to what had happened, but the road remained just a road, quiet and unremarkable. I even went to the doctor wondering if I might have had a seizure or if I had some other medical issue that caused the lapse in time. But all of my tests came back normal. There was no medical explanation for what I had experienced. As time passed, the experience drifted away, but it never completely left my mind. I found myself wondering all the time at odd times, just wondering what in the world happened. I don't know if I'll ever figure out what happened to me that night on Fletcher's Pass, but all I know is that something profound occurred, and so far, I have found absolutely zero explanations in the logical, material world that can explain it. So I guess for now, I'm left to wonder. The Silent Triangle Over Highway 18 by James C. I've always been a rational person, not given to flights of fancy or tales of the unexplained. But what happened to me on a stretch of Highway 18 last month has challenged everything I thought I knew about the world. I was driving home from a friend's house, taking the long route along the highway. It was late, close to midnight, and the road was nearly empty 
surrounded by open fields and patches of forest. My car, a reliable sedan I'd had for years, was running smoothly until suddenly all the electronics started going haywire. The dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree, every warning light flashing erratically. The radio, which had been playing some classic rock station, turned into a mess of static and then switched stations on its own. Even the headlights flickered, casting strange shadows on the road ahead. I slowed down, thinking maybe the car was having some kind of electrical failure. And that's when I saw a massive triangular craft moving across the sky. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. It was not a plane. It was huge. Each side of the triangle seemed as long as a football field and it moved with a slow, eerie grace. The most unsettling part was how silent it was. There was no sound, no engine noise, nothing. Just this massive, dark shape gliding overhead, blocking out the stars. As it passed over, the electronics in my car went completely berserk. The lights inside and outside the car started flickering rapidly. The radio was just bursts of static, and the engine started to sputter. I pulled over, heart racing, and watched in awe and fear as the craft moved steadily over the highway, casting a huge shadow on the ground. And then, as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. It accelerated at an impossible speed, disappearing into the night sky without a trace. And just like that, my car returned to normal. The dashboard lights went off, the radio came back to my station, and the engine steadied. I sat there for a long time, trying to process what I had just seen. My mind raced through every possible explanation. A military aircraft, some kind of giant drone, a trick of the light, but none of it made sense. The size, the silence, the way it affected my car, it was all beyond my understanding. When I finally drove home, I was in a daze. I didn't sleep much that night, and the next day I started looking for answers. I searched online for sightings of similar crafts, and to my surprise, I found accounts of other people who had experienced the same thing. A silent, large, triangular craft, sometimes accompanied by electrical disturbances. I tried talking to a couple of friends about it, but I could tell they were skeptical. They offered half-hearted explanations. Maybe it was an atmospheric phenomenon. Maybe it was a secret government project. But I could see in their eyes that they were uncomfortable and didn't really believe me, but they weren't going to tell me that. The encounter on Highway 18 has never really left me. I keep wondering if I will ever see that thing again. I knew at some point in my life that there had to be things out there we didn't know about, but I never expected to encounter them. Not like this. Not alone out on a road in the middle of the night. Whether or not I ever find an explanation, the image of that silent triangular craft will never, ever leave me. The Unseen Watcher I've always had a deep connection with my dog, Max. He's a German Shepherd, known for their intelligence and keen senses. Max was more than just a pet. He was my companion, my protector. We lived in a small rural town, surrounded by dense forests and open fields. The kind of place where night skies were a canvas of stars, untouched by city lights. It was a clear, crisp night in mid-October. I had just finished dinner and decided to take Max for a walk. The air was cool, and the night sky was exceptionally bright, with the Milky Way stretching across the horizon like a celestial river. Max was usually calm during our walks, but that night he seemed uneasy, constantly sniffing the air and looking around. 
We walked toward the edge of the woods where the open field provided a perfect view of the sky. That's when Max's behavior changed drastically. He started growling, a low guttural sound that I had rarely heard from him. His ears were perked up and his body was tense. I followed his gaze, looking up into the sky, but I saw nothing unusual, just the endless expanse of stars and the faint outline of the Milky Way. I tried to calm him down, thinking maybe he had sensed a wild animal nearby. But Max's attention was fixed on something in the sky. His growling grew louder, more aggressive. I felt a chill run down my spine. There was something unsettling about the way he was acting, something I couldn't explain. As I stood there trying to make sense of the situation, I noticed a subtle change in the atmosphere. The air felt denser, almost electric. The night sounds of crickets and distant owls seemed to fade into silence. It was as if the world around us had paused, holding its breath. And then I saw a faint pulsating light in the sky. It wasn't a star or a plane. It was something different, something otherworldly. The light moved in an erratic pattern. It zigzagged across the sky and then hovered in place. I realized that we were not alone. Max's growls turned into barks, loud and warning. I felt a sense of dread wash over me. This was not a natural phenomenon. The light started to grow brighter, illuminating the field in this weird ghostly glow. I could see Max's fur standing on end. He was defensive. I knew we had to go. I grabbed Max's collar, pulling him away from the field, but he resisted, his focus still on the strange light in the sky. I tugged harder, my own fear mounting. I didn't know what that light was, but every instinct in me screamed that it was dangerous. As we retreated, the light began to dim, fading back into the darkness of the night sky. Max's barking subsided, but he kept looking back, as if he knew something was still out there, watching us. We hurried back home, the silence of the night now feeling oppressive. Once inside, I locked the doors and peered out the window, half expecting to see that light again. But the sky was just as it had always been, a blanket of stars. I couldn't sleep that night. The image of that pulsating light and the feeling that it gave me haunted me. Max stayed by my side, vigilant and alert. The next day, I tried to talk to some neighbors, but nobody else had seen or experienced anything unusual. It was almost as though what Max and I saw was meant only for us. I tried to research phenomena that could explain what we saw. Drones, atmospheric conditions, secret aircraft, but nothing fit. The way the light moved, the feeling it gave me, it was beyond any logical explanation, and none of the other footage I've been able to find is quite it. Max eventually returned to his normal self, but occasionally he stares up at the sky like he's waiting for something. I could never shake off the feeling of being watched or something lurking just outside of my perception. That night was simple, perhaps, but it changed my view of the world. Now I believe in possibilities of mysteries that I didn't before. I don't know what we saw that night. Maybe it was a visitor from another world or maybe it was something even stranger. But clearly there's something out there that we don't understand. At least, not yet. One night a long time ago in the mid 80s, I was riding around my hometown at about 10 p.m. with three other friends. Berkeley County, South Carolina was a really country back in the day, so driving around at night on dirt roads is one of the things kids did to have some fun. 
The place we were driving to was called the Gravel Hill Light. It was down a long dirt road in the middle of the Francis Marion National Forest. There were no street lights of any kind and no houses for miles. Up until that point, I had seen the light a few times and even to this day, nobody knows what it is. I know it's so bright that it's almost like a welder's torch, but about a hundred times bigger. There's no sound at all and it disappears as soon as it appears. Anyway, this night we were on our way to see the light. We would usually park our car where the dirt road divides into another road, and after 10 or 15 minutes, the light would appear. We were driving and we hadn't even made it halfway yet to the place where the road divides, when we saw in the distance a red glowing light with fog and the outline of a body standing way down in the middle of the road. We had to drive slow, like 25 miles an hour because of all the potholes in the road. We were curious and we all said, what's that, at the same time. Then the glow turned off for about two seconds and came back on. This time, there were three to four figures standing in front of the red glow. And this time, they seemed to be about 50 feet closer to us than before. They were in contorted positions, but not moving at all. The light went off again, and two seconds later, it came on. Again, they were much closer to us, and this time, there were about 10 figures silhouetted against this light, all standing in weird positions. I began screaming, Turn the car around, now, I mean now. Everybody in the car quickly agreed to turn around and get out of there, which is exactly what we did. Back then, I always thought of the figure standing there as ghosts, but nowadays, I'm thinking more alien than ghosts. At 18 years old in the 80s, it just never occurred to me that it could have been alien, but now, it makes so much more sense. My friends and I really haven't talked about this since it happened. This happened probably about two years ago, except my memory of when it happened is really hazy and I struggled to place it on my timeline. I would say I was about 15 years old, and it was the middle of the night. I live in a two-story house, and the second story is quite high, so I sleep with the curtains wide open as I like to look at the stars. For reference, the window that's in this room takes up almost the whole wall. I woke up one night, and my room was completely bright, my bed is in the corner opposite the window, and all I could see out in my window was a blinding light taking up the entire window. My bedroom was completely lit up, and I could barely look out the window because it was like looking into the sun. I sat there for probably about two minutes, absolutely paralyzed with fear, before I decided to grab my phone and film it. The second I grabbed my phone, the light went out and my room went back to dark. I couldn't make out anything through the window as my eyes had to adjust since it had been so bright. And once I could see, after about maybe a minute, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I wrote myself a note to look at in the morning because I needed evidence that it hadn't been a dream. I eventually got back into bed and tried to sleep but the adrenaline and fear kept me up for hours. I managed to fall asleep eventually, and when I woke up, the note was exactly where I left it. I spoke to my family, but they were all adamant that they hadn't seen or heard anything. I have explored every logical possibility, including sleep paralysis and night terrors, and even the possibility that I was hallucinating. But I've never hallucinated before, and I haven't since. I have no history of mental illness other than depression, which I wasn't struggling with at the time. And the same with night terrors and sleep paralysis. 
The note I left myself is proof to me that I wasn't asleep when it happened. This was during a time when I had some weird experiences happening while I was asleep. I would wake up with strange bruises and scratches all over my body almost every day. My memories from around that time are very hazy, and I can only remember bits and pieces. That time of my life is almost blurry to me, and I usually have an excellent memory. Any possible explanations? Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him, telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, Hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, I'll see you again soon. And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point. And then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here. But after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. Once it stopped, though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago, but now I just can't stop thinking about it and the oddness of it all and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy, which I don't know why that's my fear but part of me thinks if there's a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband as it's literally keeping me up at night.